boink, and boink. Okay. Hi there, lemons. How's it going? You are the winner of the coveted first award today. Yeah, I figure a lot of people can use this because I've been using all of these terms in my videos and uh, haven't explained any of them yet. I'm just like, what? You, you haven't read FLC's essay on the subject? And then I'm like, oh, wait, that would involve reading an essay. People don't like to do those things. So I'm going to explain the essay in video form today and how I simplify it to make it a little bit more digestible to players who are just coming up through competitive because there are some concepts in there that get really advanced and really really specific that can really only be applicable I think in a more coordinated setting than a lot of people are playing in so I tend to simplify his ideas a little bit hybrid's gonna be stacked yeah you're not wrong um, what I'm going to end up doing here is breaking them into all of the different hybrids that there are. Um, and maybe even making some extra tiers on top of that. Um, cause like, even aware of the essay? Yeah, exactly. Uh, boom. This guy. This guy right here. This guy right here. I don't know why it's got a slash edit on the URL. I cannot edit this, but this is important document. This is, oh, that didn't send on Twitch. That's interesting. This is essay that all of Western Splatoon is based on. <laughs> so, well, you know, for, and I mean, you could say for better or for worse, but generally for better, I would, I would say. There's a lot of uh, good stuff in there. Hello, hello. Okay. So, my thinking here is that I am going to get started with the obvious ones, the ones that I think are the very clearest examples of a given role. And uh, hopefully, you know, while I'm going through the easy stuff, <laughs> that will give everybody time to kind of filter in so that we can have a good old fashioned barnyard brawl over all of the remaining ones that are a little bit more complicated. Um, so let's start with a disclaimer here. This system is heavily, heavily based on and influenced by FLC's document Fluid Priorities and Roles in Splatoon 2. Um, I would say that this right here is required reading for any competitive player of Splatoon 2. That said, my system is not exactly the same as FLC's. Um, I have some, some differences in some cases, differences of opinions, and in some cases, simplifications of his system. Uh, one of the most noteworthy that you can see on the screen right now is that I include a support section on my list of weapon roles. Uh, you will, FLC does not do that, um, and I will read for you out loud his reasoning for that. I have very consciously not used the term support for this role because the kind of playstyle that people tend to associate with support can optimistically be described as pretending to be useful. So he has a significant disdain for this generalized idea of the support role in Splatoon. And I want to make that very clear to everybody, and I want to make it clear that I'm going to use it anyway, <laughs> and that I have my reasons for doing that. Um, so, <laughs> this is, he's, he's low-key right. Like, there are some pieces of what he describes, like special utility, for example, essentially a special spammer is what, he, what he's writing there. That is something that you do see at the highest level of competitive Splatoon play. 
Um, and it's not necessarily coming out of something like a Splattershot Jr., although I guess that's the first thing we'll put up here. Um, but in general, you're going to see a lot of these like painting and special spam weapons in competitive play. And I think that they have enough of an archetype in that regard that they can be put here. But I'm also going to be talking a lot about how the support needs to be doing something other than supporting. Um, and that really goes back to any of the roles, but I think it's most clear on support. Because um, I will talk about some weapons that you could probably say fall into the support class, like this guy right here, that are just awful when they're played that way. Um, so I'm going to dump that back here for a second. Um, before I go further, the one other thing that I want to talk about is this, uh, is that on screen? Yeah. Okay. This section right here. Roles are about what your weapon should be focusing on and specializing in, but you do not play the same role for the entire game. Splatter shots will have to anchor. All right, rapid blasters will have to slay. Th things will have to happen in ways that are not kind of prescribed for them according to the role that I will be assigning them here. The junior will have to be a slayer sometimes. And in fact, it's not the worst weapon at doing that in some cases. But the reason that I'm categorizing them here is that these categories give you an idea of what your weapon is good at doing so that you can try to do more of that thing in a game. Um, if V Jr. isn't alone in the support category, you're wrong. Okay, well, I mean, Custom Jr. also is just a worse version of that. Like, tell me I'm wrong, Bab. Tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> Roles are fluided. Yeah, that, that is a really important thing. And that's something that, uh, you know, Jamie... Jamie's actually a really good example of this. Because Jamie was a, a support player for the Grillers. Um, and... Deleted, basically. Sure, whatever. Jamie's a support player for the Grillers. But the Grillers didn't have too many people who were playing aggressively and initiating fights. And so there are a lot of situations where Jamie has had to learn with something that he's used to playing supportively to push forward and play aggressively. I would still consider Jamie a support player, but in order to be able to play his weapons as effectively as possible, he really needs to be rotating between these roles a lot of the time. What is really the benefit of roles? Because from my point of view, it just removes the nuance from the weapons. Um, so there, there is a good argument to be made that putting these weapons into boxes is problematic because we're pigeonholing them. We're putting them in the back boxes. Um, that can be something that makes you think more narrowly about it. But thinking more narrowly about it, first of all, has its utility. Because then in, for example, my Matt Mode of the Day videos, instead of saying, well, this is a good position for a, a uh, let's say, custom junior, this may not be exactly quite the right position for an arrow spray. Like, they're going to play relatively similar. I'm going to have a few ideas that can work generally across that class of weapons. In uh, in medicine, for example, or you know, psychology or whatever else, we have diagnoses. We have patterns that we can identify, which we recognize... If we see this pattern, this thing works to help it. Um, and so, yes, all of these are unique and none of them are going to work exactly the same way. But we can make some generalizations about large groups of them. And even though we can recognize that there is nuance that goes beyond what we have time to talk about in a conversation like this, we also have some things we can learn about all of them at once, and that's a much more efficient way to go about it than me running a tutorial on how to play the gold arrow spray when I don't want anyone to ever play that weapon. I can just throw it in with a whole bunch of them, and if you really insist on playing that weapon, well, here are a few ideas for you. That's kind of how I'm thinking about it. So, 
Hello, everybody. That, um... That should be enough disclaimers there. Um, so, basically, yes, I recognize that this is a generalization, that it's stripping some of these things of their nuances. There is going to be a very large hybrids section. Um, most of the weapons probably fall into there, to be honest. Um, but I want to get at least some baseline weapons down so that we understand where our thoughts are on the basic archetypes. Um, and from there, we can uh, start breaking out and talking about the, the weirder fringe cases. Okay. So... Sploosh, um, uh, that's going to be one of these weird, a sploosh is a rat weapon, um, and I almost want to even make that its own tier right now. I think I'm going to do that. Uh, so I'm going to add a row below. Um, and so what is a rat weapon? A rat weapon is a very fast, zippy weapon who is trying to go into your base and do annoying things. Um, they are going to play more of a skirmisher role a lot of the time, but it is also a weapon that is perfectly capable of, like, deleting people if you leave it alone and don't pay enough attention to it. Um, so I'm generally going to put, I would say, all of the brushes into that category. Unle well, huh, permanent ink brush... Permanent ink brush might actually be the exception to that rule. That, that'll go into a different kind of here. So, eh, no, rat is a hybrid. Rat is a hybrid. Because what a rat weapon is doing is it's kind of skirmishing, but it's also a weapon that has all of the attributes of a slayer, which is given the opportunity to murder you, it will absolutely murder you. Um, and it's trying to, like, worm its way. A lot of rollers fit this description as well um it's trying to worm its way into a position where it's really annoying to your team and you have to deal with it even though there's only one of them um and it uses you know fast movement speed or stealth to try and get around and, and do stuff like that um so do i like the rollers in there actually i don't think i like the rollers in there because they're not they're gonna hard engage they're gonna hard commit to something so i'm gonna okay uh, is there anything else that's a rat weapon? Oh, th those dapples are definitely rat weapons. Um, because these ones in particular are all about getting into your opponent's base and setting up jumps to them and stuff. Um, I would say Tetras probably meet this same description. Um, maybe Emperies? And Perries are a little bit too high commitment. I don't know about that one. Okay. It's like, see, the, the rat weapons, I won't say, so tent, I think, is actually a, a classifiable skirmisher. That's what I would personally say. Um, and most of the brellas are going to be doing that, too. Because the thing about the tent is, like, yeah, it can kill you if it gets at, like, point-blank range really quickly, but... It doesn't get there really quickly. It doesn't have a great way in. Whereas the rats are all about their mobility. The rats are able to just, like, zip around and be annoying because you can't actually pin them down. They're too fast, too zoomy. The tent straight up skirmishes. Um, I, should, I should talk about all the different roles. I'm getting ahead of myself. So, quick definitions here for those who don't know. Slayer is weapon that is designed specifically to get kills very quickly on unaware opponents. So... One of the classic examples of this is a T-Tech. It is a weapon that has just inkjet directs, splat bombs that can roll at your feet, and a pretty darn fast kill time on a weapon that can move to you pretty quickly. This weapon gets zoned out and outranged by an awful lot of different stuff. Um, if, you're, if it's trying to just start a fight head-on, it's usually going to lose against a lot of the weapons in the game right now. But... Its job is to take advantage of people who are not paying attention to it, and it does that very well. Um, another really good example of this is the Nautilus. Another really good example of this is the V-Splash. Um, V-Splash is going to play a lot less supportive. It's playing more for kills than the Neo-Splash. Neo-Splash is more of a hybrid. We'll, we'll put it here for now. Um, 
Yeah, and I, I would say this is more of a hyper two. So um, that's the Slayer role. These are, I think, my favorite examples of this. I guess you could put Luna up there as well. Um, so like, you know, the sharking weapons. So Sea Blaster. Um, so th there are a bunch in there. I'd say Fresh Squiffer definitely. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave this here. So this sort of area and even maybe the Nautilus are a couple of places where I will start to disagree a little bit with FLC. Um, FLC has a category called utility. And what he would call something like a Nautilus is crossfire utility. It's a fast killing mid-ranged weapon. Um, I personally think that a Nautilus and a T-Tech play very, very similarly in that they wait for one of their teammates to start a fight so that they can finish it. The Nautilus just like gets its charge, swims it around a corner, pops out, and deletes someone before they're able to able or ready to do anything. Um, if you catch a Nautilus out like unprepared without charge or something, it's vulnerable just in the same way that if you outrange a T-Tech, it's vulnerable. It needs the rest of the team to set it up. But once you set it up, it gets that kill very quickly and very um, consistently. So that's how I think about the Slayer term. And again, this is starting to differ a little bit from FLC's thinking on the subject. So totally understand if this is outside of the paradigm that other people are thinking. Um, this is just kind of how I have found it most easy to explain the game, I think. Hello, Annie. And hello, Charged Bonsai. Okay. Um, skirmisher. Uh, tent is a really good example of a skirmisher. Um, what else? Um, CDS. Um, yeah, I'd say CDS more than Tetris in here. Tetris I've used as an example of a skirmisher before, and I'm on the fence about Tetris. I think they fall more into rat than they do here. Um, but we'll, we have to explain these core elements before we explain what distinguishes the rat play style from the straight up skirmisher play style. Um, I do think that machines actually do a pretty good job of skirmishing here. Um, I would also say that the rapid blasters do I want all of the machines in here? I think I want all of the machines in here. So machine is a relatively slow kill time. It's not like you're going to try and sneak a machine behind someone on a flank on a consistent basis to try and get picks. But what they can do is use their really big hitbox and their pretty darn good range and their ability to hit up over ledges and some other stuff to start a fight and engage someone and force them to move or to force them to respond to you. And then they are really good at backing up and zoning you out with their really big hitboxes. Um, it's one of those weapons where you, you usually just don't want to end up in a 1v1 that it is to start, decided to start with you. Um, because even though it's a relatively slow kill time, if you stay there in that fight, you're more likely to lose it. Um, the skirmisher's job, and this is basically taken straight out of FLC's book, is you are looking to force fights and not lose them. That doesn't mean that you force fights and win them quickly. Um, the, you'll, you'll notice that a lot of the weapons that we have actually have relatively slow kill times. The CDS is a really, really lackluster kill time. Um, these need two relatively slow sloshes. This needs a direct and then an indirect with a really slow fire rate. They're not the fastest killing weapons. If you get one of these at point blank range against a T-Tech or a Luna Blaster or something, they should always lose. But the thing is, they don't do that. They stay at a certain range, they make it really annoying to approach them, um, and they just kind of engage you and take away options so that other players on the team can play off that. Um, like, I would even probably put Bamboo here. Um, 
this is maybe stretching it a little bit because bamboo has elements of anchor and elements of slayer in it too um but the the typical way that i see bamboo played is like they advance until the point where they're at their furthest range forward they engage you and then you're forced to either back up and respect their range or go down um they're not going to splat you like extra quickly unless they get like an mpu shot or something like that um so that's probably where i end up with on bamboo i could probably be can be swayed otherwise by bamboo players if they think that they play those differently but that's kind of where i see those being um, so the idea of skirmisher in general is you draw aggro, you draw attention to yourself, you force the enemy to do something that they don't want to have to do, and then you don't die. Tent, perfect example of doing that. What a tent is going to do is they're going to take a position opposite to where the rest of their team is going, and they're going to very slowly take space behind you. And you're, you're like... Ugh. We can't just let him flank us. We have to do something about this guy. And so you put two players on the tent. And meanwhile, the other two players are in a 2v3. And the other team, if they're smart, takes advantage of that position and wins the 3v2. And now the tent is still alive because, oh my god, how do you kill this thing? And you're at a significant numbers disadvantage at that point. CDS is a great example of what FLC calls an evade skirmisher. An evade skirmisher has such good mobility that they are able to just kite you back forever. Um, the CDS should just like... Oh, well, I should put VDS on here too. Those weapons should just like never get caught. They should just kind of... Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this in a similar place to... I'm going to put this in a similar place to the K-52, which we'll find is in a, a hybrid role. Um, so these weapons, they will go into 1v3s, but not like hard engage into them and be like, hey, hey, look at me. And then just jump tech backwards and jump tech backwards and jump tech backwards and make you chase them. And the you chasing them part is what they're looking for. They're looking for you to put yourself out of position from where you want to be. They're making you waste time getting back into mid and getting control of strategically important locations. They're maybe setting you up so that a slayer who's sharking around a corner is able to take advantage of the fact that you're distracted by them to get an easy pick. Um, so that's kind of what they're out after. Um, another thing that FLC will classify as a skirmisher is a weapon that is pretty long range and takes good advantage of terrain. So in his view, the dynamo roller is a type of skirmisher. Um, this is something where I can see where he's coming from in that, like, yeah, it's kind of similar to the way that a Rapid Blaster plays, and it's going to, like, force you out of position. But it's also, like, in terms of engaging you and keeping you busy and drawing aggro, that's that doesn't seem like it describes it exactly to me. Um, I kind of look more at those like either anchors or slayers so like trick skirmishers is what he's talking about mid-range weapons that have some way of abusing the map itself to fight safely this is more of a semantic argument because we know what a dynamo roller does it's one of the most unique weapon classes that there are like you know what it does if you play the dynamo roller it's just like in these four areas, what do we call it? Yeah, that's kind of up for some debate, I think. Um, reading chat real quick. Why is Dynamo not a rat? <laughs> um, I mean, anything can be a rat if you believe. Anyway. So, hey, uh, since Devi's here, we anchor, 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 do 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 do, anchor, 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 do 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 do, anchor, 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 do 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 do, anchor, 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 
Okay. Um, oh, and Expo. Uh, and ball. Uh, yeah, we'll go ballpoint and the heavies. Just get all of those up there. Okay. So, having talked a lot about a, a skirmisher, basically your general idea there is your goal is to engage the enemy, so start fights, threaten people, and not die. That doesn't necessarily mean your job is to finish those fights and splat people, but it means that your job is to make them think twice about approaching the area that you control. Um, and so it's, it's that thinking that's making me, like, uncertain about whether I like bamboos and dynamos in there, but... I don't know. I'm going to drop bamboos into hybrid, and we'll talk about those. Those will be a, a weird little fringe case, I think. Dynamos can probably stay. They're not, like, trying to sneak up on somebody. The only other argument I would say is that dynamo is part anchor. Um, there are some cases where you could consider it one, but I don't know. I don't think it's going to get enough value out of that unless the other team literally doesn't have any one of these weapons on it. Um... Is as soon as something outranges a dynamo, it really isn't going to play that much like an anchor, I don't think. It's going to play more like a flingza. Speaking of flingza, that's something we need to get up into. Well, actually, wait. Flingza plays more like a support sometimes. I don't know about that one. That one's actually probably going to be hybrid. Crap. Yeah. We're running rapidly running out of space where we can uh, talk about the, the purebreds here. when <laughs> We have to start talking about the, the weird hybrids. Um, I think we should definitely put the, these, like, main umbrellas into Skirmisher tier. I don't think there's really much... Just, well, this one's going to be part support, so that's a weird one. But this one is definitely Skirmisher, and this one is... <laughs> uh, we're going to put this in the does-not-have-a-good-roll category of hybrid. Um, so I'm going to really quickly this and you're going in there because you're bad okay um all right dynamo and hybrid dynamo and hybrid so you're arguing uh, anchor and um, had to tell, technically skirmish, but seems more like a hybrid for the given comp. Um, we're talking with dynamo. We, we could, we could put dynamo in hybrid. I'm okay with that because I, I feel like there are some, some areas where it's difficult to find perfect consistency with, a bit between like, the idea of like a trick skirmisher and what a skirmisher is actually trying to do and like what these weapons often play like. I was like a rapid blaster, yeah, it's going to start fights and it's going to get in your face, but it's also going to play really, really safe a lot of the time. Like it's going to play to the fullest extent of its range. It's, it's almost like an anchor on some comps. So I, I'll put it here. It's got a wall. It's going to, like, poke at people and not kill them very fast. But, yeah, the it, it's a pretty complicated question that we're trying to answer here. Um, blobs are definitely going to be hybrid. That's one of the key hybrids I want to talk about, actually. Tri-Sloshers, though. Those are Slayer, 100%. Um, they are not going to... They have, you know, some support kind of specials. Specials you'd expect to see on a support weapon. But their overall play style is very aggro and all about finding unaware players. I would say the duelies are... Th these particular duelies are Slayer. Um, you might try and make the argument that because it has Baller, that the K duelies have some skirmisher aspects to them, but... I think having dodge rolls is actually even more of a commitment for these weapons than even, like, moving around like a frontliner. Um, 
I think that these weapons actually have to commit harder to fights than most of the weapons in the game. So, unlike the Tetras, which have four rolls and can shoot in between those rolls, and so it can kind of just zip around, I think they're solidly in the Slayer category. Um, but da -da -da -da. So, FLC would probably categorize these as skirmishers because they can, like, hit up over ledges and they can kind of engage you with their range and kind of force you back. But I almost feel like I want to disagree and put the sloshers into Slayer. I, man, I think I might actually put those in a kind of hybrid tier because they don't have the fastest kill time, but they have pretty good ones. And they are often playing for kills rather than to, like, draw aggro. Because a bucket really doesn't want aggro on them. They don't want people run it, rushing them down. They want to, like, keep their range on some. I guess that's sort of the... Ugh, I'm torn. I think I think I should still put them Skirmisher. If I'm, if I'm going to put Rapid Blaster skirmish, Skirmisher, I need to put the Buckets Skirmisher. Um... Because these weapons will play the similar way to like a, a machine or a rapid blaster if they're being rushed down by a, a frontliner. Um, they'll like walk backwards, use their range, throw out hitboxes, try and discourage a fight. Um, do I agree with that though? I guess here we have to make a decision about how we're going to define Slayer. Because um, if we define Slayer as narrowly as FLC does... Um, oh, I've scrolled the wrong way. Skirmisher... Slayer. Um, we narrow it down to... Um, the, the Slayer's job is to walk up behind a distracted or disoriented enemy team and hold the trigger for three kills and 100 Twitter points for their sick gameplay clip. Um, if you narrow it down that far, there are only so many weapons that apply. But if you broaden it slightly more to weapons that play for kills, I think it is very clear, for example, that the K-Pro would go up here. I think you could even make a pretty strong argument that the Soda Slosher should go up here, and maybe even that, like, what else would be another... That, like... Even something like a, a 96 could, like the 96 gal could potentially go up there. Um, that it's waiting for a fight to be set up for it. And then when that fight is set up for it, it wins it pretty darn quickly. So, what the heck? We'll rock the boat a little bit. Uh, I'm going to take the contrary position, but I want it known that there is definitely. I want it known that there is definitely some hesitance to do what I am doing here. Because <laughs> um, I think, like, this kind of weapon is probably something that FLC would more put in a skirmisher role, a trick skirmisher. But I think that these weapons are more going to put kill threat forward. Um, they're not there to get you to fight them. They don't want you to fight them. They want you to run away from them. They want you to be scared. Um, and if it is in that context that we're making this, I would probably put the bamboo up here too. Um, they use their kill threat to either zone you or get the splat, um, is a way that I would put it. Whereas a skirmisher, their job is to waste your time to get you to shoot at the wrong thing. I don't think that is an element of these weapons here. I think these weapons, they are either going to kill you or force you backwards. And either one, I think, is playing the role of a frontliner in some regard there. So, anything is a slayer if I can get a quad and 100 likes on Twitter. Where did you get those role definitions from? So, this right here is FLC's document, Fluid Ro Prior Priorities and Roles in Splatoon 2. I am making some distinctions here because I think that especially the utility role here gets very complicated and has a lot of different things mixed up in it. I think, for example, crossfire utility is easier to explain and has more in common with the Slayer role 
than it does with this big catch-all role that involves a whole bunch of different things. Um, and so I'm making a different system from how FLC explains it, but I'm using a lot of his theory. Um, it, it's I can't reject very much of what he's saying. And when I make it this way, I have to clarify that I am simplifying his system rather than that I am necessarily like um, explicitly denying it. Um, he is the better analyst. He is the more knowledgeable player. He's played at a higher level than I have. Um, but when I explain this to someone who's like A rank, I feel like there's more in common explaining for them how to play a soda slosher as there is with like a nautilus than there is with something like a, a tent umbrella it's like the tent umbrella is trying to take a position where you're forced to deal with it the soda slosher is trying to take a position where you can't deal with it um the, the tent wants you rushing it the soda slosher really wants to take a position where it can just kill you or force you backwards and so if we're defining Slayer as a weapon that either kills you or forces you away, I think it fits in there a lot better. And I think that that is an easier archetype for people to latch onto than the very specific way that FLC frames it that is specifically adjusted for top level play. Um, so all of that being said, let's get, let's see if there are any more obvious ones here. Um, I don't even know what you're doing if you're playing Octo Shot. The T Tech is right there. Um, Carbon is Slayer, hundred percent. It serves no other role on a comp except to get kills. Um, it is it is not got you know survivability except for stealth. So I think that's I, I think I, I've talked myself out of putting it in Rat. I think it definitely just goes here with the other one-shot rollers the the car i don't know what else it's supposed to do it doesn't do this job very well but it goes there too um and this goes here too um flingzas i think this flingza you could probably call a skirmisher because it has a wall and it's hmm i don't know this is almost more like a skirmisher slayer sort of archetype. This is really similar actually to the, I would say the K-52 in some respects. Okay, we'll leave that one off for now. Mini is definitely a hybrid. Um, oh, L3D is gonna be more on the slayer side, I would say. Um, And then, uh, oh, uh, Splatter Shot is going to be Slayer. It's not as good a one, but it is one for sure. Looking to see if there's anything else that I'm missing before I get into the really wonky hybrid. Uh, I've got Bamboo out there. I don't know, but these are one-shot weapons. I'm actually going to put these in Slayer 2, since we've decided to make that distinction, that the whole goal of these things is to finish a fight quickly, to get picks. Um, it's not going to be painting an awful lot. You definitely don't want it to be drawing all of the aggro, and it's not long-ranged enough to be a true anchor. Um, I guess I've seen Gootuber maybe take some kinds of those positions, but I don't know. I'm going to leave it here. It's, it's short-range enough. It has to get close enough to the enemy team that it can't play truly safe the way that one of these weapons can. So I'm going to put it up there in Slayer. Um, I think the... Is there anything else that I would put the... Uh, I would put the Clash Blasters up here too. They're just looking for kills. There's not really much else you can do with one. It's not like it's going to paint. It's not like it's got the mobility or ability to flush people out from difficult positions to stay alive. It's not going to play safe. It's just going to try and go for kills. Um, do we want to put the other dapples in there? Probably. I think I'm going to put these into Slayer. The reason that this one gets rat is because it has beacons and can create situations where you're just rapidly jumping into the enemy base. 
and it starts to take on more of a skirmisher role the more that it does that sort of thing. Um, but the other ones don't have that sort of utility. They're just there to try and murder you. So that's where they go. Is there anything else? I am going to put the squeezer into Slayer as well, based on this description. Um, I think that this one, the foil squeezer, I think this one's a little bit more complicated, but like this one, it's either going to push you back or it's going to kill you. And those are the, the two things that it's really going to do. It's not like it's the most powerful painting weapon in the game. Um, and it's not long ranged enough to be considered an anchor. Plus, you know, if it's going to go in and use its bubble combo, that's just straight up engaging and trying to get quick kills. So I think that's where I would categorize it. Um, I don't see much else for how I would put it. So, V-Jet and C-Jet in supports. Um, I, I can see where you're coming from on that in that they're going to play for a lot of special spam, but they also have the distinction of having super long range and being able to use that to take safe positions and maintain their team's presence in mid even when they're on the back foot. So I think that elevates them away from the support role into the anchor role. Um, elevates them is not a great word, but okay. Uh, this Nautilus, it's got a baller. It's still not gonna play like a skirmisher. Let's just put that in Slayer. Um, the other blasters, this one's definitely Slayer. A couple of these are just, I don't know what you're trying to do with them in the first place, but they're there, I guess. Um, we'll just put them in Slayer and be lazy about it. Uh, there's probably some elements of other roles that you could attribute to them. Um, but this one, I think, is the inkjet one, so that one definitely goes there. Then this one is the rain one. Put this one. I'll just put all of them up there and stop thinking so hard about it. Okay. Uh, this one is, I'm going to say, hardcore support. This one, it's getting baller spam. Does I, I feel like I'm literally just saying, is there anything that a baller does that we would consider Slayer? It's probably more Skirmisher because it's just going to get baller and try and draw aggro onto the baller and then paint until then. Uh, we'll keep that in hybrid. This one... Yeah, I'd probably keep that in hybrid still. Okay. Um, this is the Bomb Rush one. This probably still goes Slayer. I don't see what else this thing's doing. Put it with the other Luna up there. I'm just trying to get all of the the cleanest ones out there so that we can talk about the like mixed cases here. Um, okay. I think we're... Uh, this can go rad as well. All right. So, the next one I'm going to put in is Slayer Support Hybrid. So, I'm going to classify this as plays like support until it has special, then eats your face. And two very important weapons go in here. That's the K-Shots and that's the Zap. You could probably also put the Zap 89 in there. This is a lot more support of a kit. Um, but I would probably still put it there. And this is a worse version of it, but I think it goes there too. Um, you would probably... Put this in here and this in here, although there are worse versions of that. Um, this goes in here as well. 
So these are weapons that they're going to play around their specials. Like, they're going to farm for a lot of their specials on purpose. But, like, they're not just an armor bot. They're not just going to, like, throw bombs and stuff and then go, go ham with them. Like, these weapons actually have... I don't know. I feel like this should actually go up into here because these weapons are just not good at fighting. Whereas these weapons are actually pretty not bad at fighting at all. Um, and I think that's one of the big distinctions between these two. I think one of the reasons, honestly, that these weapons are favored right now is that they can do more than one thing. Um, these weapons, when you put them in a, a tough situation, like... This is just a T-Tech in slightly different coloring, right? This is a weapon that can absolutely slay if you needed to. This weapon only splats two frames slower than a T-Tech. Um, this weapon, when it gets on top of you, has some of the best DPS in the game. Like, these are actually really strong choices for a close-up fight where you just need to splat someone. Whereas these weapons are really only designed for painting. They just have way too much aim RNG. And they are actually just going to try and paint as much as they possibly can. Um, is there anything else that I think goes into that tier? Um, this is in a really weird spot because the permanent ink brush is one of the best armor spam weapons in the entire game, but it's also going to play like a skirmisher. Like it's going to do brush things. It's going to do rat things. Um, so, I think I am going to put it in the same category just because it's got that same kind of game gameplay of... Ah, but it's support skirmisher, if anything. I think this one might need its own label. So... And I don't know if there's even anything else that's going to go in there, but we're putting that in there for now. Um, Flingza... You know what? I'm going to take this piece out of it and just leave it as Slayer Support Hybrid in general, because I think Flingza is a great example of this. This is a weapon that can absolutely get under a ledge and shark you and kill you, just like any of these rollers can. But while it's not doing that, it's farming for missiles. Um, and just farming and farming and farming and outpainting most of the weapons in the game. Um, and so that's much more of the, the support archetype. So that's probably where I would put that. Um, I would also put the 96 in here, actually. Because uh, the 96 has a really, you know, pretty quick, consistent kill. It's about as fast as the 52 gal is at killing things and has longer range. And it paints for armor. And paints for it pretty quickly because it's got the sprinkler with it. So it's got elements of playing for armor support. But also if you, you know, set up a kill for it, it can absolutely do Slayer things and just take that player out. So that's what I'm thinking for that one. Um, the Luna, the Cluna is also just in a really weird spot. It's got like fizzy bombs, which it's going to use to paint. It's got Rain, which is a very standard, like, supportive special that is going to paint the map and, uh, you know, create zone control, and it can kind of let its team move in with that. But then it's on a Luna Blaster, which is really a hard Slayer archetype, so that's in a really weird spot. Um, Mini. I would probably put Mini in here, too. It, it has, like, the missile spam aspect of, like, the K-Shot, but it also is kind of like a discount Nautilus in the way that it's going to take fights. Um, like, it can absolutely go for fights, especially with the, the Burst Bomb. Like, that is a really useful addition to its kit to add chip damage and apply damage pressure. So, that's probably what I'm going to say there. Um, I'm going to put this in What Does This Even Do? Because that's a really awkward weapon. It, it just doesn't have a way to walk forward at anybody. It's like, the supports, they're, what they're trying to do is set their team up with what they are doing. And then the like Slayer supports, their job is to set their team and themselves up with what they are doing. This doesn't set anybody up. <laughs> it doesn't get a lot of picks because it can't move forward into the enemy team. 
I guess it can hold its ground pretty well. So if anything, it's... But it doesn't have the range to be an anchor. So it's, yeah, th that's just in a really awkward spot where I can't really classify it too well because it's bad. Anchor skirmisher hybrid. I could see that. The problem with this... Because the skirmisher is like... Their job is to force you to engage them. You don't have to engage a cherry elf, a cherry H3. Like, what's it going to do? Like, bubble at you slowly and then not pop the bubbles? Like, put up a wall and then, like, walk forward in front of that wall and get bombed? Like, it doesn't have a way to move off of its fortification that it's trying to build. And it doesn't enforce that fortification hard enough that it can do, like, bamboo things where it's like, if you step into my line of sight, you are dead, sir. Um, but, uh... This might end up being... J j just a, a single tier, but... This is my take on why the K-52 is one of the best weapons in the game right now. Um, it is a very fast kill time with range that beats all of the standard, like, short-range frontline weapons. But it also has a wall and booyah bomb. So, like, it kind of just doesn't die. So, it can just push into 1v2s. And not only can it waste the enemy team's time, but it probably kills someone while it's in that 1v2. So it's like you're getting the benefits of skirmishing the enemy team in that you're drawing disproportionate numbers to you, but you're also just slaying. And so, like, putting a K-52 on a team just kind of gives you a numbers advantage. Um, so I would put this there. I think that that is a... Now, I, what you could also say is that there are worse versions of this, which there are, which are these two weapons. So I would put these here. These are all trying to do the same thing that the K-52 does and not doing it quite as well, because this one has Splashdown and this one has Baller um, and also has to roll for its fast kill times. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm going to go with that. Uh... Ooh. Hmm. Hmm. No, I, th I think I don't change this. So, 52 actually does a very similar thing, I think, to what a Krakon roller does, which is it gets a pick and then it has Baller to keep itself safe. Luna does this as well. Um, so it's like, you can maybe say there's a little bit of skirmisher to that, but not really, because the Baller is to keep yourself safe. It's a survivability thing, not a I'm distracting the enemy team right now thing. Um... Vanilla L3 is actually really popular in Turf War, I found out after I made the, the tier list video. So, uh... Because, like, it paints really well, and then it gets a relatively aggressive special that it can use to also paint a lot, but keep itself safe when it gets caught out is the more important thing there. So you just have a bunch of, like, L3s scattered around the map, painting mindlessly, and as soon as they get threatened, they just ball her to safety. <laughs> So I guess that kind of makes it a hard support in that use of it. Because um, its whole job is just to paint the map and play the objective. Um, since that is the major use case for it, I'm going to put it in support. Even though in a an actual like a game of ranked or, or something, this is not how it's going to play in all likelihood. Um, but it's a really awkward kit for anything other than that sort of turf war play style. I feel like that's the best use case for it. So... I kind of like Tent in terms of being good at surviving and threatening a fast kill time. Um, good at surviving and threatening a fast kill time. The thing with Tent is that Tent needs to get right on top of your face to get that good one-shot kill time. And it's not super consistent unless your aim is absolutely cracked. Um, whereas 52, it's pretty easy to hit two 52 shots. Um, it is... One of the, the important parts about a Slayer weapon is that it will get kills consistently. Um, like, if you put it in a position where it is at its optimal range and positioning relative to the oppos opponent player, 
it does not lose that fight. A roller is going to beat you if you tr swim out over a ledge and don't know it's there. Like, no shot that you, you screw that up. Um, if a T-Tech gets right on top of you, it has the fire rate and everything that it should probably win that fight at, at an elite level of play. A Nautilus can laser you down as fast as almost any other weapon. Um, if a, you get on top of a squeezer when it has bubbles, or if you get into the squeezer's range when you don't have range on it, you're just going to lose that fight. With the tent, you get close enough to it, and uh, the pellets might all hit you, or it might be too far out of range, and it has to go for a second shot. Um, really, if people play around tents smartly, th they're going to see it coming from a mile away and know to not stay in that range, so you're a lot less likely to get kills. But a K-52 can push its range into you. It can be like, this area is mine now. Oh, you want to fight for it? I win that fight. Um, like, it can put the wall out and just kind of ratchet its way forward on the map. And there's not a lot that you can often do about that. Um, I feel like this is probably... Hmm. Because it's going to go Slayer mode when it pops Hammer. And until then, it's just going to kind of paint up and use its wall and try and do K-52 things, I guess. Uh, it's not going to skirmish, though. Like, well, I guess it kind of can skirmish, can't it? Um, I'm going to take out the very well part, because this doesn't do either of those things very well. But it it's probably trying to do a pretty similar thing and goes here. Um, notice that all of these have walls. <laughs> um, and that is basically what is enabling them to do those things. Uh, but also, well, because it doesn't have quite the same kill time until it has hammer. I'm just going to put this here. <laughs> Like, it, it it does a number of things pretty well, but none of them really fit into the niche. It's, it's got a really weird case of kit mismatch. Um, Blugas. This is going to have to play like a Slayer, even though it has Ink Mines. Um, Klugas is pretty confidently... I would say this is more in the support category. Yes, it, it has a much better kill time and stuff than these other weapons do, but the way that it's going to play at large, well, mm, even saying that, I think it probably goes here. It's going to play mostly supportive, but it has the firepower to do things, and that's that describes the K shot. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with putting it in that category. Uh, only a few more. This one, uh, Curling Bomb and Ray. That's like, Curling Bomb plus 52 screams Slayer, and then Ray screams Anchor. <laughs> and so it's kind of stuck in the middle between the two. It definitely isn't good at skirmishing. I guess I'll put it in just pure Slayer, probably. I don't know. I'm on the fence about that one. Um, Forge. Forge is playing for kills. It's not like it's playing for paint that much because it doesn't paint that well we'll put it there it, it's doing squeezer things but worse um the this is weird but i almost feel like putting this one in skirmisher because of the way that i see it play which is it holds down one area and just slowly backs away and makes it as difficult as possible for someone to push through it it like puts a, a point sensor on your area so that if you go through, you're marked. It puts rain in front of you to slow you down. It holds an angle to make it difficult for you to push through. It's like wasting your time a lot of the time with this weapon, which is almost Skirmisher, but it doesn't want aggro on it necessarily, not at least hard aggro. I might put this in like... Slayer skirmish. Uh, hmm. I don't know. Because the answer with a lot of these weapons is, what do they do? Not much of anything. 
<laughs> um, Dindarashi used to use the oh yeah the KL three yeah um, basically he abused hammer on it he used the L 3s very fast painting to get hammer faster than you could with any other weapon that had it until sploosh seven um, and then he would go in with that. But he used the range in the meantime. Because what Arashi was doing was actually rat stuff. You could almost take this and put it down here, the way that you saw Arashi playing it. Um, Arashi's whole thing was he was going to push into the enemy team's base, and he was going to 1v2 them. And because he was the better player, he was going to win that 1v2 anyway, and the rest of his team would have a perpetual 3v2. And that was the way that Arashi played the game. It, would I recommend that a normal player try to do that? No. <laughs> like, Arashi took this weapon and put it in this tier. But could a normal Splatoon player, you know, who's playing on an even playing field with everybody else, do this? I don't think so. And so I... <laughs> that's kind of what I... Difference between Rat, Skirmisher, and Slayer, and both Slays and Skirmishers. That is a good question, and that is something I, could, I should clarify. The thing about a rat that distinguishes it from this category is that the rat uses its mobility to um, basically run away until it finds a good fight. Its job is like to get deep into the enemy base, to take the weird flank routes that nobody else is going to take because nobody else is fast enough to take them. And to be like, haha, I'm in your base. You want to do something because I'm in your base? And so it's like... When you challenge them in their base, they're probably going to kill you. If you really hard commit to them, that's when they win the fight. But rather than, like, getting in your way and being like, oh, you better fight me. You better fight me right now. Oh, but you can't fight me right now. Their whole thing is more, hee, come chase me. Ha 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 ha. Um, and their, like, ability to survive is based on their ability to not ever get caught in the first place. Um, the advantage that these weapons have is, like, they can just fight you even though they're drawing aggro deliberately. Um, here, they have to kind of bait you into making the wrong move. Here, they can just walk forward and kill you anyway. Um, whereas, like, the Slayer weapons, they expect that a kill is going to be set up for them. Um, they expect that another weapon is going to get someone's attention and initiate a fight and that they're going to finish it. Whereas the rat weapons, they're more going to initiate pointless fights for the enemy team that enable your team to win on a macro scale someplace else on the map. Um, so maybe that's not even skirmishing. Because, like, skirmishing... L let, let me draw a picture here really quick. Okay, let's take... What's a, what's a good map for rats to mess around on um let's take muscle forge muscle forge can get obnoxious okay so this should be a pretty good angle to see the whole thing okay yeah so like let's say i am mr sploosh man and i'm like he he i'm going to be in actually no the clam is probably a bad example of this Let's do zones. Yeah, let's do zones. So, objective is way over here. And I'm Mr. Funny Sploshman. And so I'm I'm like, okay, we kept the zone. I'm going to go all the way over here. Wee! Ha ha ha! Fight me! Fight me! Do something about me! Ha ha! I'm so annoying! And what you're effectively doing is taking the opponent's attention off of the fight that should be happening. Whereas, let's say that we're playing a more traditional, like, skirmisher slayer sort of thing. Like, let's say we've got a CDS here, and then we've got a T Tech who's sharking here. CDS starts a fight with someone where they're like, oh, I'm gonna spot you, I'm gonna spot you, you better do something. Oh, nope, I'm, I'm retreating, I'm retreating. You, you can't catch me, you can't catch me, haha. -ha. And it's not going to get the kill 
super quickly because it has a slow kill time and because it has to focus on backing up a little bit. But over time, this player is going to get baited into looking in this direction because of all the pressure that's going on. And that is when the T-Tech takes the fight and deletes this guy. That's the sort of skirmisher slayer archetype. And one of the most important things to realize about especially the rolls for rolls sake section here. I don't know why it's saying that the document has changed a lot. This section here, static roles have no place in this game. I do not use them. You need to recognize that you will play every role over the course of a game, or at least multiple roles. Let's say that in this fight, blue guy knows that there is a T-Tech over here and turns their attention to fighting the T-Tech. It is then the role of this CDS to come back into the fight and reinitiate and put kill threat on this guy. That's not what they're best at doing because they kill really slowly, but somebody whose back is turned is killable with every weapon in this game. And so in this situation, the CDS is playing the Slayer role and removing this player from play because they have their back and they're taking advantage of that to remove a player from play. So again, we have to take all of this with a grain of salt because like, all of these weapons are going to play all of these roles at some point. You're going to get an x Splosher playing Slayer sometimes. That's a terrible weapon to be doing that, but sometimes it has to. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's exactly the right one for the job. So we look at something like this. And I'm like, well, the weapon screams Slayer because... It has a relatively fast kill time and pretty decent range that it can use, but it doesn't have a great way of getting out of good situ bad situations, but it does also do a lot to inhibit the opponent with its kit from moving toward it. So it's almost on the skirmisher side. I'm going to drop it here and just be done with it. Um... I would say that this is Slayer Support Hybrid. You're going to farm for armor or missiles, but it can absolutely get picks when it needs to. Um, it has pretty good range. It can stop people in their tracks. It's almost in the sort of range as like the bamboo is, where it's kind of a brick wall, where if you slam yourself into it, like you just get stopped. Um, so, yeah, it... If we're being, you know, specific about exactly what impact they're having on the game, I would say that the going back to the question that Brambo asked, Skirmisher Slayer, both slays and skirmishes, they're kind of doing about the same thing, but if I'm trying to explain to someone how to play Sploosh and also explain how to play K52, I'm going to explain those two completely differently. Like Remember that the overall goal of me making this is so that when I make my Map Mode of the Day video, I can explain to you, here is what this thing is trying to do in the game. Um, these weapons are playing to get kills using whatever unique attributes their weapons give them so that they can get those kills. These weapons are playing to waste the heck out of the enemy team's time to give their Slayer weapons good openings to go for fights, either in the fights that they're creating or elsewhere on the map. And that's exactly what the rat weapons are doing as well, except the rat weapons actually have a pretty good amount of kill threat if the opponents engage them in the wrong way. Whereas these weapons tend to be pretty slow killing or inconsistently killing weapons as long as they're played around effectively. Um, these weapons go in like a slayer and position like a slayer and go for fights, but they can kind of just stand out there in the open because they have something unique that gives them safety to go and take those fights. Whereas something like a T-Tech has to shark around a corner, whereas a Rapid Blaster has to shoot you over the side of a wall, a K-52 can kind of just walk at you and take whatever space it wants, and it can engage that fight, it can start that fight, but also win it. So... That's what makes it especially strong. And then these are like far weaker and more inferior versions of this weapon here. 
Um, I think the glu K Glugas, they like they are almost there with the baller, and like the the ninety six with wall. This was busted in Splatoon one um, when it didn't have splashdown. I forget what what other special it had, but like the this is like this happened k52 happened in splatoon 1 and it was the 96 that had a wall um so like that combination of things is strong it's just the special is what holds it so far back um okay uh this squeezer um this almost plays like, like an anchor i almost want to put this in anchor um because while it doesn't have quite the same range, so it's hard for it to contest these other backline weapons, it has a wall to put up so that it can still be as safe as these weapons are, even from shorter range. And it has Stingray, which it's going to stay in the, on the backlines and farm and just try and get picks on people from. I almost kind of want to put it there. Is that too spicy? Is there going to be a riot if I put the vanilla squeezer in anchor? I might put it there. Um, man, these weapons I do not see an awful lot, so it's kind of hard for me to conceptualize what they would want to do. Um, the the Zimmy I still insist is is a what does this even do? Like it's it's got a main weapon that says like support a main weapon that says like support Slayer hybrid. It's got a sub that says straight Slayer. And then it's got a special that says straight support. I guess we could just put that in Slayer support hybrid. All I said was Slayer and support just now. Kind of a weird combination of the two. Um, yeah, I think I'm okay with that. Um, and we can probably just put K-Mini in there. Well, because it's just going to farm for... It's Hammer. I feel like this one almost actually has to be Straight Slayer. Because it it's not providing anything to the team overall, except for some paint. And it, like, if you want a weapon that paints a lot and also has Hammer, I guess you're going for a Sploosh instead. So this is more, like, you've got some range support. Yeah, I, I'm comfortable putting that in full Slayer, I think. Does it use the next wave? Both Squeezers can do just about whatever you want them to. Hard to put them in a single roll. It's about what you want to do with Squeezer. That's valid. They're... And remember, you know, the rolls are very fluid, as as noted by the very first word of the title of this article. Fluid rolls and priorities. Um, this one has wall, but it's a flingza, so it's going to paint for bomb rush. So it's kind of supportive. I'd say that still supports Slayer Hybrid. Not so noticeably different. Um, okay. Oh, right. We just have these in hybrids right now and we haven't actually classified them. Uh, this definitely goes Slayer Support Hybrid. Um, this is actually going to go Slayer Support Hybrid. The reason this is going Slayer Support Hybrid is that it is 100% a support weapon up until it has bubbles and then it's suddenly the most dangerous weapon in the entire game. Um, and it, it, it goes for kills at that point. So when it has special, it is a slayer in a very similar way to the K-Shot, but in a more extreme variety. Uh, oh, this will actually go in the sports skirmisher category. It, th th these two have friends now because um, it's going to paint a lot with its torpedoes and like give utility by pointing players out with the torpedoes. That's something that like the uh, the Zap does with its auto bombs, the Zap 89. Um, so it's got those supportive aspects, but it's umbrella, so it's going to play more like a skirmisher, um, and it's going to farm for armor, which gives it support. Yeah, yeah, I'm very happy with that categorization. Dynamos, are we good on like? I feel like it's kind of like anchor slayer hybrid. I'm interested what Devi thinks about this. It's like a little too short range to be like a true anchor where it's just going to play from safety. It has to take some more advanced positions, kind of like these guys do. 
but it's also gonna position far back enough that people are often gonna jump to it. You could almost say similar things about the jet and the explo, that they're more of like a slayer and anchor hybrid, that they can't play perfectly safely all the time. I might actually, hmm, that's an interesting think. Uh, yeah, I'll leave those where they are. Um, Anchor Slayer, but it has support specials. Uh, I think Booyah is a pretty aggressive special, and Stingray is more of an, if anything, like an Anchor special, because Anchors want to be able to use their specials from a safe distance, from safety. That's kind of something that defines them. So, like, Stingray and Missiles are really good anchor specials. Yeah, I, I think I'll go with... Uh, I mean, if, if, if it's just going to be Dynamos, we might as well just call it Dynamo tier. <laughs> right? We'll, we'll do that. And Blob is actually... I am going to... I am going to put Blob in its own tier that I'm going to call Anchor Support. Um, I think what the Blob does is relatively unique among all of the weapons in the game. Heavy, heavy, heavy painting weapon, but also has a lot of range and can threaten from that range. Um, it's just not very consistent at slaying. So unlike something like a, a, a blaster where you know you're going to hit those two shots if they're in range for you to hit them, with the Blob, it's like, well, they might move into my Blobs. My Blobs might bounce off something and kill them. You're kind of just putting a zone of vague threat in that direction. Um, but it, it's going to play very supportively. But it's going to play very supportively from a position a little bit further back. And it's going to use the safety of that position and its range. So I feel pretty confident that that is like a, a good like anchor support hybrid. Um, Slayer anchor would also go to ballpoint though, right? Um... You're not probably going to use ballpoint to like go for flanks and you like you can in some rare situations, but it's not your overall game plan. Um, unless we're talking like I could see a ballpoint doing something like this on like starfish with one of the flanks because uh, like hydras will do it too, where they they flank around on the grates and appear on the enemy's wing Um and laser people from there and that that's like a slayer play that they can make but like i'm putting hydra in anchor still it's not that i'm saying that because that sort of a play exists that i'm going to move it out oh wait the vanilla ballpoint though because it has a an ink jet uh you make a valid point there See, my take on it is that the ballpoint is just mismatched with its kit, but should still generally play like an anchor, even though its special doesn't support that play style. Um, in a similar way to the Clash Blaster, where it's got Stingray. What the heck does a Clash Blaster do with Stingray? I don't know. But the way you're going to get anything out of this weapon is not by playing around the Stingray, it's by playing around the main weapon. And so it'll go in Slayer anyway. That's that's kind of how I feel about the ballpoint, that I think it should generally just play, be played like an anchor. And, like, the the heavies play a little bit more aggressive. They play a little bit closer to how, like, a mini will play or a Nautilus will play sometimes. Um, but they're not as good at that. It's just the fact that they have short range means that sometimes they kind of have to go and make a play like that. And most of the time they want to play as an anchor. That's my take. So... I think I'm good with that. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm actually going to order these really quickly because I think that there are... I want to make a distinction that there are some weapons where it's like they definitely have a role and they might be outclassed for that role, but these definitely have something that they're doing. Um, with the hybrids, it's like I want to make the distinction like this weapon is one of the best weapons in the game because it can do two things very well. These weapons are some of the best weapons in the game because they can do two things very, very well. Um, in some kind of order there. Like, then there are some weapons that it's like, yeah, this has got some some elements of like a, a one of these things and some elements of one of these. They're like, some of them just don't work as well. Some of them are, are not good combinations of thing. Like, so I'd say that these are actually kind of like ordered um, in terms of, how much of a role they have. These have two roles. <laughs> These ones have one role that they play very well and a second role that they can very easily switch into if they need to. Um, these ones, they have kind of a combination of two things that when you put them together, they add up to, yeah, you, you still have a weapon on your team if you have a sploosh. Uh, it's, it's not just a complete waste. But you go further down the line and you get to a weapon where it's like, this should be a skirmisher, but it has a special that one is useless to everybody, but two is, if anything, a slayer special. And it's got ink mines, which are more of like a supportive anchor sty style of thing. So like nothing that it has synergizes with any of these useful things that a weapon can do. So what is even the point of running it? This thing... Literally, you've got T-Tech right here. Why would you ever? Um, this thing is like trying to skirmish, but it doesn't have enough of an ability to engage the opponent. So all it's really good at doing is not losing a fight. Um, which, sure, like if you try to fight it, it should probably win. But you also don't need to try and fight it. It has no like mobility or pressure to force you to fight it um so like why use cherry h3 and then k kl3 is just in such a weird place that i don't really know where to put it Frank, honestly like it could be a lot better than i think it is but it's just not that many people pushing it okay these weapons do have a role and here's the vunder <laughs> Doctor shot different from T Tech. Uh, yeah. Okay. Look, it it's got the same fire rate, the same range, the same number of shots to kill. You know, same damage. Um, it's got the same movement stats. It's got the same sub. It's got the same special. So a lot of it is is pretty similar. But look at the paint job. Like, ew. Look at how vibrant and colorful and exciting. This screams summer fun. Okay. This is like. You, you were trying to be steampunk, but you forgot that colors exist, I guess. It's just very uninspired. Anyway. Make it just play 10th tier. I think all of these weapons are actually pretty darn good, except maybe the undercover. Like, these are tr like weapons that tr truly can just skirmish and like stop you from winning a fight against them. That's kind of insane. Um, the ability to do this is very, very strong, and that is why I attribute there to being, like, fewer examples of this. Like, support, there are weapons that do both support and also other stuff, so I would say that there's more support weapons, but in terms of true skirmishers, maybe you put, like, a, a Tetra Duelies in here, too, because Tetras don't actually have the fastest kill time. Um, if you have really good aim, you can, like, do damage in the middle of the rolls, that helps them a lot, but... My strategy as a T-Tech player is to rush one of these down and just out DPS it. Um, so, like, it does rely on its dodge rolls to evade things. And I have classified it in my videos as a skirmisher before. Um, but if, I, if I'm talking about, like, macro, macro game plan, how does it play? It's going to do rat things. It's going to run around like a sploosh does and be like, oh, I'm over here now. You got to deal with me. Um, 
in areas that might or might not be important for the enemy team to actually be dealing with you. Um, very similar to like how a brush will and stuff. So, mm -hmm. do I agree with that? I, I'm, I'm between putting it in rat and putting it in skirmisher. That just let it be known for the record that that is my my take on that. Okay. So, one final review, really quick, so that we know. Um, so that we know what, what our definitions are and we know how to use this information to watch my videos and get more out of them. Um, so again, this is not the same system that FLC uses. This is a very simplified version of it. He would disagree with using the term support at all. Um, he would classify it as, let's look at this, um, utility and split that between crossfire utility defensive utility which i guess is if you get on top of the rainmaker you can delete it immediately is is my take on that and special utility um i defensive utility is one term where i would need to see more examples of that being a specific reason that people choose a weapon rather than just a nice side effect of having the weapon that's one where i'm like is that a is that a thing that people base their whole team comps around that they like look at as the main archetype of their weapon? Anyway, I, there are some things that I may have slight disagreements with FLC about and also some ways that I am probably misusing his terms. Uh, he would call, for example, a rapid blaster or a dynamo a skirmisher straight up. He calls them trick skirmishers. I, I use the term skirmisher a little bit differently. Um, skirmisher is a weapon to me that its job is to draw aggro. Its job is to distract and to be able to stay alive while doing so. So CDS, it gets into a fight and then it backs up and kites you. And if you keep running into it, you lose that fight. But its job is not to win the fight quickly. Its job is to prolong the fight. Same with the tent. A tent gets into your side of the base, into like your base somewhere or some annoying corridor, and it's like, well, you can't move me now, haha. And you burn like all of your resources, all of your ink, trying to get rid of it, and then you know it pops hammer and makes you sad anyway. Um, meanwhile, the rest of its team is actually doing things that are important to the objective, and you're like, ugh. If we only could have dealt with the tent faster, we might have been able to stop that push. Um, the machines they kite back in a similar way to the cds they don't have quite the mobility but they have a monstrously huge hitbox on their weapon um and enough of a kill time that they can discourage most frontline shooters from trying to push into them brellas their whole thing is i'm gonna get one person shooting at me and they're going to waste their bullets shooting at me and then either i'm going to be able to find an opening to get a shot in on them while they're focused on fighting me or a teammate is going to come in and help me but i'm going to be able to occupy space i'm going to be able to draw a disproportionate amount of enemy fire and basically waste their time before we can do something good with that that's the same sort of idea as the undercover umbrellas except the under, under undercover umbrellas are way worse at it because their shields get shredded too fast and they don't do enough dps to have a good kill threat um like you think cds dps is bad <laughs> This thing takes like 52 frames to fire a shot and needs three shots. It's it's terabad. Like literally a slower kill time than the dynamo roller. I'm pretty sure that's actually true. Think about that. Okay. Hi there, big nice burger. Okay. Uh, so Slayer, your job is to take a fight that your weapon has an advantage in of some kind and get a kill from taking that fight. Usually you're not just gonna take that fight head on. Usually you're going to get picks in a coordinated or high skill environment by waiting for the opponent to be distracted by something else and then going for that pick. Um, so that doesn't rule out something with longer range or a slower kill time like the Rapids. Um, you know, if somebody bur gets burst bombed and the Rapid sees them get, bur get burst bombed, the Rapid can just go in and land a direct and that player is deleted immediately. Um, I think they have Slayer utility for sure. That's 
mixing two terms. I shouldn't use the word utility. They, they can play the Slayer role in that regard. And that is oftentimes something that's really powerful about them. Um, but the thing about something like a Rapid is that even if they don't get the kill on the first shot, a lot of the time you are out of range to do anything about them. And the second shot is definitely going to kill anyway. So you still get picks that way. It's kind of in the same way that an Explo gets kills, except the Explo plays more of an anchor role as it's trying to have that impact. Because you think about a, a Hydra like, oh yeah, it absolutely slays. And that's the main thing that you're bringing it onto the team for. But it also plays from a far back enough position and can still slay. And that's what categorize it is, categorizes it as an anchor. That's why I've got anchor last. Because the anchors are going to do these three things. For the, Well, maybe not skirmish, but they're definitely going to have like slaying and support potential. But the point of anchor is that they do that from far enough back that they can give jumps to their teammates, that they can hold down entire spaces of the map in ways that the other weapons can't. And that's the utility you're really bringing them for. I keep saying utility. I'm probably not going to be able to break that. So these weapons are looking for kills in advantageous ways. These weapons are looking to set up kills by drawing a disproportionate amount of attention and wasting the opponent's time and getting in their way and being generally very annoying. These weapons are all about making these weapons do their jobs better by painting the map a lot and by using specials that benefit the rest of the team. These weapons are looking to shut down space by having very, very long range and having kill threat on anything that wanders into that space. And then these are some mixes that arise out of this sort of thinking. So, for example, KGAL can just immediately delete you because it's, it has a really fast kill time, but can also just put up a wall and waste your time while it gets an angle to delete you from. Um, and that's what makes it really strong. The K-Shot is going to play like a support because it doesn't have a lot of advantages to help it push into a fight like these weapons will, but it paints pretty well for missiles, and once it gets missiles, that's enough of an advantage that it will go in and absolutely tear up another uh, an opposing team in much the same way that a T-Tech can. It's just its ability to slay is very conditional on it having that special. Um, same kind of thing with Enzap and Neo, Neo Splash. Neo Splash really can't... I almost want to put it here. Not not there. Wait. It's slay, it can slay and support very well. Because um, it's like... No, yeah, th this is the correct tier for it. I'm just overthinking it. Um, the Neo Splash can be played pure support and can be played pure, spl pure slayer. Unlike these two weapons, which really kind of want to do both, this weapon can just specialize in either or and have significant success doing both of those things um, it was played as a support for a lot of the game's lifetime and it's only now recently been like oh wait this thing is like perfect accuracy and an insane fire rate and like even while jumping it has perfect accuracy and it has lightweight weapon speed like that's a lot of slaying utility um, it can really do both things very very well uh, which is more than you can say for most of the weapons in this tier um, and then this weapon paints for missiles, and that's all it does, and that's why it's bad. This one, I think if this one's played well, it should probably be rat tier. I might have, I kind of want to put it there. Yeah, it's going to paint. Yeah, I'll put it there, I'll put it there. It's got the beacons. It's going to, you know, try and be jumping into your base and doing rat things just like the rat dapples will. I think I'll move it there. It's just like a bad rat. <laughs> Rapid Pro playing like an Explo. Yeah, Rapid Pro. Did, where did I put that? Oh, I put that in Skirmisher. It's almost an anchor. Um, it's got so much range and so much survivability that it's almost like it's playing from safety. The reason I say otherwise is that it can stay alive for a long time because it's got its wall and because it's got its range. And also it's going to be pushing a little bit further forward so that it can take out enemy backline weapons. Um, like it's not going to wait for things to push into it. It is going to play a little bit aggressively when it's given the space to do so. Um, so like... I could see the argument being made for Anchor. Anchor. 
it's like an anti-anchor. It, it's used to counter anchors. And so I've always thought to like make it... Now I'm thinking Slayer support. Because it has this very specific purpose, which is it pops armor to keep its team safe. And then it can like go in and harass backliners and get them out of position. But it also has a wall, which lets it stay safe and draw aggro. But it's not trying to draw aggro. That's really not what its goal is. I think I like it here. Gold arrow can be played as a rat weapon. Yeah. Mm, that's actually probably more if more of a the right choice actually for that one. Would I even consider this a support, or is that more of a rat? Honestly, I think both of these actually do play more like rats, now that I think about it. Well, okay. This one does kind of get played like a junior a lot of the time, but then it goes a little bit aggro with its special. But also, you'll just see Kiver like pushing into enemy bases with this thing. Granted, that's probably because you're trying to outplay them, but... I'll probably take this one and put it in Rat, because it is kind of going for more of a an aggressive play style. It's not like it's farming booyahs to try and support the rest of the team. It's trying to farm booyahs just to get kills and use burst bomb. Yeah, I'll put it there. I'll put it there. Um, I think these two are more solidly in this position. This one, by the way, because of its role in Turf War, in case anyone wasn't here when we made that distinction. Classic Squiffer in Slayer when it's a midliner compared to New Refresh. Um, so when I say Slayer, like frontline, midline, backline are range distinctions. Those specifically are there to talk about how long range the weapon is. And as you can see, I've got some pretty long ranged weapons in here, as well as some pretty short ranged weapons in here. Range is not really what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking more about what the weapon is trying to do. Um, the, so like the Hydra, for example, is trying to get picks or at least have kill threat, which is like, okay, well, doesn't that make it a slayer? But it's also trying to do that from so far away that the enemy team can't safely push it most of the time. And that gives it the additional usefulness that players can super jump into it and it can kind of hold map control in a way that most Slayer weapons can't. So that's what makes it an anchor. Um, but Squiffer, like, it's short range enough that it's going to play, you know, out there relatively aggressive. And if you're running one of these things, you're not running it for its paint. <laughs> you're, you're running it so that you can one-shot people with your main weapon. Um, and so, yeah, certain weapons are going to play more or less aggressive depending on their kits, but I don't think it makes a big enough difference to make it so that you're thinking for something other than kills. It's not like you're trying to draw aggro like a tent is. It's not like you're trying to provide some kind of special for your team and only ever act on that. I guess, wait, the, the armor one, I guess you could maybe consider being a support hybrid, but it's not painting as much. It's just getting special and then going in with that special. So it is like a, the beneficiary of the special rather than like the whole rest of its team. And yeah, I, I kind of like it where it's at, I think. Separating slayers and frontliners would be... Mm, I disagree that that would be a good idea. Um... Because again, frontline weapon is a range distinction that says nothing about what that weapon is doing. You've got some weapons that are, you know, frontline. You think about it like a frontline in a MOBA, that's going to be like a tank. That's going to be the player that's trying to draw aggro. So in that respect, okay, maybe you could call that a skirmisher. But these skirmishers do not have a short range relative to, say, the Slayer category here. Um, like a Frontliner, maybe they're going to be painting forward sometimes, but when they're trying to take fights, they're trying to take off angles. They're trying to come in from the sides. Like, these are more your, like, 80 carries, if we're talking about, like, League of Legends or something. 
Um, I think League of Legends is a situation where frontline and backline actually makes sense to to use to talk about roles, to talk about what that weapon is doing or what that character is doing. Because in a game like that, you want your beefy ones in front and your damage dealing ones in back where they're protected and they have range to hit over the top of your front line. But here, like, the weapons at the back line are going to slay just as quickly as the weapons at the front line, given the right circumstances. Like, an E-leader releasing the ZR button is one of the fastest kill times in the game, especially for the range that it has. So does that mean the E-leader is a slayer? I guess, but it's not a frontline weapon. And it also does the additional thing of being an anchor. So we put it in anchor because it fulfills that role. The fluidity of the roles is it de definitely makes it complicated. And so this gets into semantics for sure. Um, but I would say like these are the weapons you're, where your goal is to get kill threat on the enemy team in whatever way that your weapon works best at doing so. Whereas the anchors, yes, that might be a part of their job, but another part of their job is to be kind of the last holdout defensive member on the team and to be super jumps back in for the rest of these kinds of weapons. Yeah, E-Leader flanks really well, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Just not sold on V-Rapid Pro and Pure Slayer. Vanilla Rapid Pro. So, looking at the other options here, you've got Skirmisher, which is, it's trying to draw aggro and waste the enemy team's time. That's not really what this thing is trying to do. Um, if it gets into a fight, it wants to either be able to finish it or scare the opponent away from it. So I don't think that really fits. Support is you're putting down a lot of paint for the rest of your team and making it so that they have specials that benefit them all. Now, Rain is kind of a support special, but you're also not going to paint very much for it, and you're probably not playing this weapon if your goal is to get as many Rains out as possible. That's a C Junior, or um, maybe like a, a Zimmy or something like that. I don't know exactly which ones paint better for it, but there are a bunch of those kinds of like armor or, or Rain supports. Um, so it has a supportive kind of special but yeah. that's about all that's supportive about it to my eye like you're not going to be like waiting on this guy to call for when they've got rain and that's the go button for your team to go in because they're going to get their special slower than most other people on the map just because they're a blaster and they paint slower so I don't think that really fits. And then Anchor. Anchor is the other argument, I guess. The reason that I'm more comfy with the other Rapid being Anchor and like with Squeezer being Anchor, I think, where, where did we put the other Rapid? We put that Slayer Support Hybrid? Yeah. Um, Slayer Support Hybrid. So oh, are you arguing that it should go in the same place as the Rapid Pro Deco? I could see that. I'm down with moving it down there. Poking is a very skirmishy thing. Poking. Um, yeah, we might even, you know, if we want, we've got a, we could make a separate category for like poking weapons. Um, and cons FLC considers that sort of thing skirmishing. Um, so, like, he'll put Crossfire Utility and... Oh, actually, no, that, that's Trick Skirmishing. Crossfire Utility and then Trick Skirmishing are where he kind of categorize, categorizes that sort of thing. Um, where you're, you basically you're applying zoning pressure. So, like, Bamboo is a great example of this. If you try to walk forward into Bamboo, you get deleted. But it can't exactly run at you and get kills quickly and really play for fast kills off of somebody skirmishing for you um so like a rapid blaster a bamboo um something like a dynamo um 
those would all play into that sort of role. Uh, the buckets play into that sort of role. The the mid range ones, not the tri slosher. Um, so if we you know if we wanted to do something like that, where this is like slow killing midline weapon that zones you out. We could probably do something like that, but here's my thing. In the macro game, what are these weapons going to play the most like? Like, when we look at one of my videos, my map mode of the day videos, we've got Slayer, which is defined as pushing the objective line as far forward as possible. So if your team is here, the Slayer's job is to move it up to here and to control this space. The support's job is to lock this in by painting it up behind. The anchor's job is to take up specific positions that give it a disproportionate amount of reach like this. But um, in the same way that a support is locking in this area with paint, an anchor's job is to lock this in with kill threat. So like... You wander into this area, yeah, it might not be painted my team's color, but you're still getting deleted by this laser right here. Um, the anchor cannot push this arc forward as effectively as a slayer weapon can. Now, let's say, oh, this is a really good example, actually. Let me move to Manta Maria. Let's say we're playing Manta Maria. And... This is something that, uh, oh. back that up. Can, we, can I move this without, okay. Let's say you've got a, um, your team just got control of the zones and you put a rapid blaster right here. What is this rapid blaster doing when it's killing someone who's in this area right here? Cause like a rapid blaster can start right here with an opponent in this position and it can shoot at them and threaten them and force them to move backwards or force them to jump out. That's kind of a slayer roll thing. But then a rapid standing right here and locking down this area, you could argue is more of an anchor type of thing. Even though you're not gonna like super jump into this position, it still has kill threat on these people. So FLC calls this trick skirmishing. I kind of want to call it slaying because I feel like you are keeping this arc pushed back. You're, they're trying to move it and push it back out here and you're like, no, get back. And you're forcing it away. An anchor could not just like walk into... Oh my God. An anchor could not be here and force you backwards by walking into the, this position the way that a rapid blaster sometimes can. Um, like, if you're a Hydra or something, you're trying to get line of sight over the top of this cover rather than just walking forward and getting around the cover yourself. Um, like, a, a Crapid can just throw a torpedo at you, force you one way, and then put shots the other and make you back up. So it's more of an aggressive roll that I think it plays. And I think it, it's, you could describe it more as pushing the objective line forward for your team than you would describe it as holding down this area all the time. Like you are actively forcing the opponents backwards until they decide to deal with you. And I feel like that's more of the Slayer archetype than it is the other stuff. That's where I'm getting all of that from. Trick skirmishing also falls into the fluidity aspect because he says that trick skirmishing is designed only to work in specific areas, which it is. Um, I think uh, the rapid bla one of the reasons the rapid blaster is so strong here is because it can hit up over ledges here and take sight lines and like, if there's a charger up in this position, the rapid hits it before the charger can walk far forward enough to get a shot off. Um, so... That's why the Rapid Blaster is so favored in that matchup. It's because of the terrain. So I think FLC's, you know, label works really well for it because it is very descriptive of exactly what is unique in that pattern of play style. 
the reason I don't like to use it is because it's a relatively specific class of thing. Like, the smallest one is probably Skirmisher, because, you know, there are all these supports down here. Smallest class is probably Skirmisher, and I would say that there are probably very few that are Trick Skirmishers specifically, even if we break that down further. Whereas, like, a lot of these weapons are just, I would call these Slayers, even if we remove this, even if we remove this, and this, and this, and this. I think there's still way more Slayers. And so... The other thing is, like, if I talk about how are you skirmishing, like... The way that a Rapid Blaster skirmishes is just not at all the same as the way that a CDS skirmishes. Um... The, the CDS is going to skirmish by, like, playing very mobile and backing up, and the Rapid is more going to skirmish by occupying space that it controls very well and standing very still. So telling one player to play in a similar way... Uh, let me put it a different way. The idea of a skirmisher is to draw aggro in, in my voicing of it. Um, your job is to get the other team's attention and waste their time and to engage a fight and not to lose it. It's very easy for a Rapid to engage this fight and very hard for them to lose it. But you're also not trying to draw aggro so much as you're trying to suppress it. You're trying to prevent anyone from getting into a position where they can contest you. Whereas the CDS's whole point is to get you to contest it, to get you to look at it, like to distract you. The Rapid Blaster is not a distraction. The Rapid Blaster is a barrier. So I think that's why I draw such a distinction between them. Um, so hopefully I have at least made it pretty clear to everybody um, like why they, why I call these things the way that I do. Um, and like, if I'm, you know, drawing up a plan here and you happen to be a weapon that's outside of the role of Slayer, but you think that your particular weapon has a good opportunity to push the enemy team further back with some part of its kit, then yeah, absolutely step into that quote unquote Slayer role where you are pushing this backwards. Um... Again, the, the roles are fluid, and so where I put these weapons is probably the least important part of this stream. What's more important is understanding what these words mean when we talk about them in the Map Mode of the Day videos. Um, so, like, because I'm only going to talk about these four because it's too complicated to be like, okay, so Explos in particular should go here, whereas the Hydras should go here. Um, it's going to be different depending on the weapon. Um, by the way, the backline positioning guide is based on this weapon right here. And I guess this one. Mostly this one. Any other weapons that are in this, this tier here might well work a lot differently in terms of their positioning because of their range. Um, but that that's this is what Devi's experience has told her she can do with her Hydra. And that's what those positions on the map really mean. So that's where that's coming from. Um, but I think what's helpful about this is identifying general patterns of what should happen and knowing when that pattern applies to your weapon and when that pattern doesn't apply to your weapon. Um, so for example, there are times where you need to be a slayer on the K-Shot and you have to snap into a certain mindset. And there are other times where you're definitely the support on the team. Um, knowing that like those are two very common places that you're going to be is important. But sometimes you're going to skirmish on the K-Shot because you're going to be like, oh crap, I'm in a 2v1, but this guy with a faster kill time than me is shooting at me. My whole job is to move around and look pretty and, and, and dangle keys in front of them, as Aplo will say, um, and distract them so that my teammate can laser this guy down while they're distracted. Um, it doesn't matter if my teammate happens to be a CDS right now, if they are the one who has easy line of sight on the opponents and can start doing DPS to them, they need to start doing DPS to them. They need to start doing the Slayer role. Um, if the only thing that this weapon ever does 
is kiting back and never actually starting fights, never actually like finishing fights, then it's a much worse weapon because this weapon can finish a fight. It's just not like the best weapon in the game at doing that. And so you're trying to angle it more towards do doing the skirmishing like 70% of the time instead of 30% of the time. Mm -hmm. If it were a Vem diagram, everything would just be in the middle because they have to take on every role under certain circumstances. Yeah. Um, now, the, the purpose of labeling them in these roles is that these are roles that you should be playing more often. So the really, really the best way to label them would be with a gradient with like, give them a, a score from like zero to 100 on how well they slay and a score on zero to 100 on well, how well they skirmish. And you are a skirmisher if you're above like a 70% on the skirmishing scale. Um, and you're an anchor if you have X range or further and can accomplish these sorts of things from safe positions. Like you'd have a more complicated kind of series of numbers for it. Putting them in boxes like this is again a simplification of the system. This is, I'm just putting them in vague enough, general enough boxes that are accurate enough that we can actually talk about them in a useful way, but not categorize them so carefully that they are specifically defined to that individual weapon. Um, like an NZAP 89 is a very, very different weapon from a Neo Splashomatic. But I've got them in the same category here because they should be looking to do almost sort of the same things sometimes. <laughs> That's about as specific as a list can get without me giving a lecture on each individual weapon here. So. All right. I think I have said all that there is to say there. Um, if anybody has questions, I think I'll take a good, you know, 10, 15 minutes to address some of those um, I'm just looking at the chat now. Also going to scroll up a little bit. Tips for... Tips for Dynamo, someone says. Um, hit people with big stick. Uh, <laughs> Dynamo is all about positioning, because you, you have no speed. You need to like be able to predict every engagement that's about to happen 60 frames in advance so that you can get your swing out <laughs> to deal with it. Um, so it takes a lot of map, like uh, a lot of positioning macro knowledge so that you know when someone's likely to push you. You're not gonna be able to outskill someone. So you, you need to learn the game. You need to study the game and figure out, you know, what positions can I take? What, what predictions can I make about people's behavior so I know where I need to position this swing, um, and uh, when am I safe? Oh, that's written in German, and I can only read so much of it. And so into the Google Translate we go. A little flower is blooming on the heath, and its name is Erica. Heisa is how you indicate what someone's name is. Ich heisa gem. Uh, that's me saying my name is gem. I am called the gem is literally how that means. Dang, Mellow, chill out. Why is your name Mellow Fellow if that's how you're going to come in? Guns a-blazing. Um... Is Dynamo an anchor and Slayer or an anchor support? Dynamo is a very, it, it's a very unique weapon in the role that it plays. Like, it's its not quite long range enough to be an anchor. Because like, if you try and play a Dynamo like an anchor, it works up until the point you run into a weapon that outranges it. And then it just gets deleted from play over and over again. Like, it's really hard for the Dynamo to position safely against an enemy anchor, if that's the way that you're trying to play it. Um, so you can play safe, but really a lot of the time what you end up having to do is take more midline positions 
um, and trying to control space, um, try to take advantage of the fact that your weapon hits up over ledges, hits around corners, or not around corners, hits up over ledges really well. So like, you take a dynamo to humpback pump track, for example, so you can hit up over the top of that dome or down over the side and clear out areas like the enemy trench. It, that's more of like a slayer kind of role that you're pushing the enemy team back. You're putting pre kill threat on them. That's not something that, you know, uh, a, an E-leader is going to be actively seeking out. The E-leader is waiting for you to push into its sight line, whereas the dynamo is going to move forward a little bit more. I've even seen dynamos go front line a little bit and like sit under ledges and play like they are other ambush rollers. Um, so like you can make an argument for just straight up Slayer, but the problem is that the fire rate makes it so that it is not going to consistently get kills. Um, the only way that it consistently gets a kill is if it gets pushed on, which makes it more sort of like an anchor weapon. I don't know. Um, I, I don't think you play it especially much for the paint. Um, I think Flingza paints a lot more than it does, if I remember correctly, just because of the slow fire rate. So you wouldn't consider it a support, really. So probably, like, Slayer Anchor sort of hybrid. What did I put it at? Anchor Slayer? Yeah. That's about where we had it. Sorry, I'll be more mellow. Hi, G-Man! <laughs> Welcome, Amber Williams. You've missed the entire uh, classification, but... Um, hopefully we can at least get some, uh, get, get something out of the VOD here. Um, you have any tips for slasher? Um, wear a hockey mask and no, um, I'm, I'm assuming you mean slosher. So with slosher, you kind of think of a slosher like a, you're, you're zoning out the frontliners. Um, you like... Before you're in position to like get under a ledge and really like take advantage of that ledge or that you know terrain, you kind of just have to play it like it's a like it's a capro or something where you use your mid range weapon to beat the short ranged weapons. Um, you put something in their faces like you either run into this and get splatted or you run away from this. Um, but uh, sloshers are also just really cool like. You, did you know that you can curve slosher shots? You can like get a curved pattern out of it. It's like it's like uh, that that one movie where you, you curve the bullets. It's sick. Very hype. Slasher weapon for Splatoon three. It was an absolute ink bath. I hear people say that on commentary all the time, and I'm like, you, you know that the the term bloodbath is is figurative already and like yeah it's a, a it's really violent if you think about it but people say that all the time to refer to sports like it's kind of accepted at this point i don't know it, it i feel like it's a word that doesn't need to be swapped out if we're going to be using it in that that context an ink bath i don't know i don't know maybe maybe i'm just being too too old and molding about it Okay, um, so I haven't had an awful lot of questions here. I think I will do a, one really quick once over summary because we've got some new people who have been showing up just to give the general idea and then I will uh, shut down stream and call it for that. How do I learn to be less dumb like walking the bombs, falling off stage, going in front of people when I shouldn't, etc. Um, all of those things, uh, that is a really good question. Because I think there is a good answer that actually deals with all of those situations. What you're looking for is some kind of input from the game that triggers a certain response. You're like, when I hear the sound of a bomb and it is loud enough that that is indicating the bomb is possibly near me. That should trigger in your head an impulse to look for the bomb and make sure you're out of range of it. Um, like, it should... There are 
certain things that should immediately cause you to unfocus from what you're looking at and refocus on the other thing. Um, if you see enemy paint in, the, in your peripheral vision, you should immediately snap out of whatever else you were thinking and be focusing on that instead. Same thing with bombs. When you're near a ledge, that should be a trigger in your head that indicates do not press this direction on the stick or do not roll in this direction. Um, when you are in front, when you have like a, a Hydra player who's you know got charge and is now firing, that should trigger in your head, do not walk in front of them. You need to set up these clear cause and effect sort of relays in your brain. You need to train those reactions to avoid those kinds of situations. It has to be a proactive thing. You have to have a plan that when X happens, Y will happen. Because otherwise, you will just go on thinking about that player who's right in front of you and forget about the bomb that they dropped at your feet. Um, you will just keep playing the fight like you already were and roll off a ledge. You will just go and try and get in range and in doing so block all of the Hydra's shots. Sometimes I stop paying attention in solo queue and doing callouts to myself keeps my mind in the game. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. Um, it's There's an argument to be made that some players are actually better off not shot calling and focusing purely on their mechanics and winning fights. Um, that's something that I've heard at a top level of play that like the players who shot call the most tend to actually be the weakest mechanically because they focus part of their attention on shot calling. And I've noticed that in myself that I shot call a lot. And as such, there are times where I'm not focused on a mechanical play as much as I would be in solo queue and I play it worse. Um, so there, there is something to be thought of there, but if it keeps your head in the game, then that's definitely a good thing. Bit off topic, but as a Slayer weapon, I want to try to train not dying. Any ideas on ways to effectively train pushing the weapon to its fullest while not dying? Um, I don't think that not dying is an explicit goal that you should have. Not dying helps you accomplish a lot of goals, but it by itself, you know, the best way to not die is to play like an anchor. But that positioning isn't going to get you anything as a slayer. You need to be taking more risks as a slayer weapon than you would take as an anchor. So not dying isn't like an end-all be-all goal. But one thing that you definitely can do is think about things like not dropping into disadvantageous fights. Um, like, something that I, I point out in, you know, some players play, I, I talked about it in a VOD review recently, and I don't want to call out the person who it was for, because I do see this in a lot of other people. But uh, I talked about, I can tell that when someone gets into your range, that is triggering in your head a cause and effect impulse to immediately engage that player even though you might not have an advantage in the fight against that player. Um, that sort of thing can cause you to drop over a ledge into enemy ink and immediately get splatted. Um, so you need a more sophisticated flow chart in your head for whether you're going to take a fight. Um, one of those pieces of information that you consider should be what is the numbers advantage on the field right now? Who has more numbers? One of those should be how much paint is there in the area that the fight will be happening. One of those should be, does the opponent see me? One of the considerations should be, does this opponent have more range or more mobility? One of those considerations should be, does this opponent splat faster than me? Um, all of those are factors that um, should play into your relative level of confidence about whether you want to take a fight. So if you're taking a fight against like a Nautilus and you're playing as like a sloshing machine, you'd better be pretty darn aware that they're, they're not looking at you and they're already damaged. So you can one shot them before they do anything or you're hitting them up over a wall 
or like you have the paint to be able to back away, they're stuck. Like there needs to be something significantly um, disadvantaged for them if you're going to go and try and take that sort of a fight. Um, so hopefully that helps a little bit, Goose. It's the difference between Slayer and Skirmisher. A Slayer's job is to finish fights. A Skirmisher's job is to start fights. Slayers are generally pretty bad at starting fights because um, they don't have the mobility to get out of a fight quickly and they don't have the staying power that you might get from like a wall or a survivability special to stay in fights after the opponent knows where they are. Um, so the ideal situation, and remember one of the golden rules that FLC will tell you is that in Splatoon everything is always going wrong, but... One of the ideal plays is you get a skirmisher to get someone's attention and start shooting at you. Let's say you're a tent Tentabrella. Tentabrella goes and uh, takes an off angle on the opposing team, and the opposing team starts shooting at the tent and starts trying to deal with the tent. Well, the tent is unlikely to be able to get any picks from doing that, because they're in like a 1v2 and they need to be really short range to be able to get any splats. But because the tent is drawing everyone's attention away, that might put a T-Tech in a really good position to get a flank off and take some people out because they're looking at the tent instead of at them. Um, that might be a great opportunity for the rest of the team to have a 3v2 because two of the players are dealing with only one of your, your team's players. And so that might enable them to get picks better. So the skirmishers aren't going to be the fastest killing weapons. They're going to be the weapons that keep you back, that annoy you, that get up in your face but are difficult to dislodge. Um, whereas the Slayers are there to, like, as soon as they get an advantageous fight, as soon as they're at the range their weapon wants to be at and the position their weapon wants to be at, they win that fight very consistently. Remember that um, all of these roles, and I've said this a, a million times and I'll say it a million more, all of these roles are fluid. So if you have two T-Techs and they both push into a fight together, one of them is going to skirmish. And how do you tell? The opposing player is going to shoot at one of those two T-Techs as long as they came in from uh, like off angles, which you always, always, always should if you're taking a 2v1 fight with your teammate. One of them is going to come at one angle, one of them is coming, coming at the other, and the player, the enemy player, is going to shoot at one of these T-Techs. That T-Tech, the one that's being shot at, is not at an advantage in the fight, and so their job is to look pretty and not get hit. Their job is to dodge around and make you think, oh, you're going to hit me. No, you're not. No, you're going to hit me. No, you're not. And to just play as elusive as possible while the other T-Tech plays Slayer and goes in for the kill. Um, the, the, T the Slayer weapons are looking for situations where their opponents are not focused on them to gain an advantage and get their picks. The Skirmishers are looking for positions where the opponents are focused exactly on them. Um, and that sets up the rest of their team to do other things on the map. Do sub-weapons have a specific classification? Um, sub-weapons are better at accomplishing certain goals than others. So for example, a curling bomb on a, a, a weapon makes it a much better candidate to be a slayer because that allows it to move into position very quickly. Um, there was a meta back before MPU where the end parry dualies were one of the best weapons in the game because they could zip into a position faster than just about any other slaying weapon and then roll, delete someone, drop a curling bomb, move on to the next one. Um, and so curling bombs, you know, lend a weapon towards playing more like a slayer than anything else because um, it gives you that added mobility that lets you get into those off angles that you need more quickly. But it really depends on uh, how the weapon is able to use it. Suction bombs, for another example, are a very common support special or support sub. Um, you see those on specifically the NZAP 85 and the K shot. And being able to spam suction bombs is huge, huge, huge support utility. A weapon that cannot fight well with its main weapon can still have a significant impact on the game if it can suction bomb spam on like the tower or in front of the Rainmaker. Um, and keep people busy and occupied with that. So that's why you see that on the, uh, the not the Junior, the, the Zap, the K-Shot, the 
Silver Arrow Spray, which is going to play in a similar way, but worse. Um, also has that suction bomb that you can use the suction bomb spam. So that's the thinking behind how the sub weapons fit into it. Probably a better thing to focus on is taking good fights where you're almost certain to win. Exactly. That is exactly how you want to be playing. How should I be playing a rat weapon majority of the time? So the rats, um, their job is to get into places where you're like, how the heck did somebody get there? And to stay there for a long time because you have really good movement and to distract the enemy team. Um, you are more skirmisher, I would say, than slayer in that role because your job, you know, you can take a, a fight if they give you a good one, just like any weapon in the game. But so like, let's say that um, your team has the zones and you have gone into here and you're in this position. What a rat weapon does is it paints a lot of this and tries to draw players into looking at it. Um, and then it goes, Wee no, you can't catch me because I zoom all over the place. Wee ha 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 ha. Look at me, I'm so annoying. But then as soon as you try to actually collapse on it, um, it's sharking around a corner and it pops out from around that corner and deletes you. So it's not a, a true skirmisher in the sense that it doesn't want the fight. It might actually want the fight, but in order to get the fight that it wants, it has to kind of bait you into chasing it a little bit. Um, a Tetra Duelies is another great example of this, where the Tetra Duelies may like g let you get it within range and then dodge roll back and forth like this and like, oh, bleh, where is it going? Um, and it is then that it beats you and then that it slays you. Um, so your goal is like to use your movement to gain an advantage. And if you don't gain an advantage in the fight, that's fine. Just keep skirmishing. But then as soon as somebody overcommits to try and get rid of you because you're annoying as heck, then you can just immediately win the fight. Would fizzy bomb better suit support? Absolutely. Um, any kind of bomb that is spammable that takes up a lot of space, that paints a lot. Um, great for supports, because support weapons are notoriously bad for slaying um, relative to other choices that you could have. Um, so, like, a... Uh, that's not a... It's not actually the way that it plays out for a lot of fizzy bomb weapons. Fizzy bombs just paint a lot, and they don't have a ton of kill threat. So you're going to be using them more for paint control, more for zoning opponents away than you are for getting kills. So that's fundamentally more of a supportive play style. That's, that's a better way for me to summarize it. Why I like permanent a lot? Because if you don't deal with the brush, it will farm armor. Right, like in that situation, like the, the threat most brushes put on you is that they're going to kill you if you turn your backs to them. You know, you put like the Beacon Octa brush and it gets beacons up on your freaking top left in anchovy and it just keeps jumping there and keeps coming up and trying to flank behind your anchors and it's annoying as heck. Like that's the, the normal kind of threat you're going to get out of a brush. Whereas the permanent ink brush, it doesn't need to get kills. Like it's gonna get into the back of the enemy team and then it's just going to farm for armor from there. <laughs> so it's like, it's the one that's a little bit different. Mostly play construction machine, but use it to paint or shark. Right, paint or shark. Shark is slayer idea. Paint is support idea. How, how don't fizzy bombs have a, a lot of kill threat? A fizzy bomb can kill you if it hits all three shots. Um, or if it's paired with chip damage. But a splat bomb is just going to kill you. A suction bomb is just going to kill you. An auto bomb is just going to kill you. There's no if. And a lot of the time you can dodge out of the way of other hits of a fizzy bomb. Like, 
You get hit with one hit of it, cool, but if you keep moving, you probably get away from the other ones. Um, it's a lot less likely to kill you than other bombs will. Um, but what it does do is it forces you to move, and it paints a lot, um, more so than other bombs do. All right. Any last second questions before uh, I close things down? I think I've gone through this pretty thoroughly and uh, talked a lot. Can an anchor or maybe a shark or be a compliment to a rat that is running away? An anchor be a compliment. So you mean like, because an anchor is going to be like on the complete opposite end of the map from something that's playing the rat weapon play style. The rat weapon is going to be in the enemy base. The anchor is going to be pr pretty far into your own base. So I guess the rat could jump back to an anchor if it got into trouble, and that's an idea. Um, for running away, for it's like retreating. And like, I guess the rat could jump to a sharker if the sharker is still not seen. I'm not sure what your idea is that you're trying to get across there, if you want to clarify that a little bit. Should we post it on the Discord? I can post it on the Discord. It'll definitely be on YouTube. What puts the Slayer in the Rapid Blaster pros? Um, they take out anchors really well. Um, they have significant kill threat on someone who's standing over a ledge that it's underneath. Um, they can hit you before you can hit them. And so you have a threat to be able to kill them if they stay in that position and you force them back. And remember, one of the things that I use to define a Slayer or Skirmisher is that these are weapons that are intended to push the enemy team's or yeah push the enemy team's zone further back to push your zone of control forward um, and that is something that you can absolutely do by displacing a backline weapon that's controlling some space by preventing people from dropping out in a certain position there's definitely an argument for anchor playing that same role that they're kind of using their range to take a position that you can't dislodge them from easily. Um, I think there's definitely an argument to be made there. How does V-Pro slay and skirmish again? That's the one I feel the worst about because that's just not a very good kit. Um, that weapon is definitely outclassed for everything that it tries to do. If you try to play it like a support, other things farm the, the rain way better and farming rain is suboptimal anyway. Um, if you're trying to play it like a Slayer, why not play the K-Pro kit, which has a more useful bomb and a Booyah bomb that can keep you safe if you get a little in too deep or you want to displace the enemy team for a good fight for yourself. Um, there's just not a lot of reason to use that weapon, but the, way, the one way that I have seen it used to great effect was actually on holding elbow on the left side of Triggerfish. Um, and what the player did was they used its range to keep players back and they kept popping um, point sensors so that it was impossible to sneak up on them. So you'd like move forward and try to engage them, but you'd be spotted and you'd be outranged and you'd have to back up. And it just kind of kept players busy on that side. And like if they tried to approach even, you know, even stronger, they'd drop rain on the spot. And now they have a little extra DPS to add to their damage and they can definitely two shot from there. And so it was really strong in that position. Um, it was hard, you know, it was taking engagements, but it was in a position where it could just win them. Um, and that's kind of the, the situation I'm talking about with both slays and skirmishes. It is, it starts a fight and finishes the fight by itself. It is self-sufficient in a way that very few weapons in the game can. Um, and the one use case I've ever seen for that weapon, that was exactly how it looked. It was just completely owning the left side of the map there. Um, would Tenacity be good on anchors? It's definitely most commonly run on anchors, because the anchor should be the last player to die on any team comp. They're the furthest player back, they're the player who's positioning the safest. They shouldn't ideally be dying at all. Um, but if they are, you know, there are a lot of situations where your anchor ends up alone in a coordinated team context, and having a little bit of extra special charge so that they can get right back into it with a special ready to go when the rest of their teammates come back in, that's huge. So tenacity is more common on anchors than anything else. 
Could you argue that Cherry H3 does the th same thing as the 96, just really badly? <laughs> uh, the 96 Deco, just really badly. Um, the thing about the 96 Deco is that it's capable of moving forward better. Which isn't saying much, because the 96 Deco is a very immobile weapon. But because of the way that it's able to paint its feet relatively quickly, it can kind of splat dash around a little bit more, and it can actually take slightly more advanced positions. The Cherry H3, if it can't just fire shots to paint its feet. It really needs to kind of like walk and shoot. Um, so its ability to move forward using its wall, like the 52, the K52 or the uh, the 96 Deco do, it's not even that mobile. It's just terra bad. What makes skirmishers kill more inconsistently? Slower kill times, or in the case of the Tentabrella, inconsistent damage. Um, the Tentabrella fires 12 pellets out of its gun and you need to hit the vast majority of them in order to splat someone. They spread out over time, so you need to be very, very up close to someone to get that potential one shot, and if you don't get it, it is really, really slow. Um, so you can't count on it to slay in the same way that you can count a Luna Blaster to slay. Um, the Luna Blaster, if you hit that direct, it's gonna work. With the this one, it's like, ah, uh, if you hit the direct and you're like right on top of them, uh, maybe. <laughs> so you don't count on it to be able to slay what you count on it to do is to draw aggro and to threaten anyone who gets too close most of the other ones is just slow kill time brellas kill really really slowly cds kills really slowly needs four shots low fire rate um the sloshing machines are a little bit better but they still need two shots and i think they need like don't they need like a direct and an indirect or like two directs or something like that to be able to get a two shot kill Sometimes I know that sometimes they three shot. I don't remember exactly how that works. So definitely, you know, if you're going for a bucket that you're just trying to slay with, you're looking for one of the sloshers, not one of the sloshing machines. Um, but the sloshing machine can really skirmish hard against any of the short range weapons that try to push it. It is very hard to push a sloshing machine and actually kill it. And so if you put a sloshing machine in the right place and, you know, especially the K-Machine, you just spam fizzy bombs and maybe try to get ship damage or something, like, you're going to be able to engage the opponent without needing to, like, commit to it. Add a Terabad tier for V-Pro and Cherry. There are worse weapons than V-Pro and Cherry. Uh, like, and a lot of these weapons... We, we can talk about, like, the arrow spray, right? The arrow spray we put in uh, rat tier. This is, without a doubt, the worst rat in the game. It's literally only ever going to be able to farm baller, which is a special that's, like, kind of mid. And it's going to be able to spam those ballers. It's not going to have a fast kill time. Yeah, it moves fast. But you know what else moves fast? A sploosh. And it three shots instead of five shotting. And also has better accuracy. Like... There's no contest between an arrow spray and a sploosh in a fight. Um, so th there are weapons that like play these roles and just play them extremely badly. Varbin, why would you ever play this weapon when the Carbon Deco exists? I don't get it. I don't know why people would want this weapon over this weapon because this one is just so much slower to kill things than this weapon is. This weapon is the fastest kill time through armor in the game. This weapon is just like... You might as well play a tri slosher. And like literally play the tri nouveau. You'll still get the rain. You'll get a better bomb. You'll have probably a faster kill time with a bigger hitbox. And you'll paint more. Like, why would you use this weapon? <laughs> so it's a slayer, but it's a bad one. Sometimes I feel like I'm trying to play Slayer with K-Machine. And that's valid. Like, it does have some things in common with the Rapid. Um, but the Rapid is a lot less about kiting, I feel, than the Machine is. Um, the Machine's going to do a lot of, like, jumping backwards and, sh and sloshing. Um, because, uh, 
of a, a couple of different reasons, um, which is an option that you don't want to be using on a blaster because the MRNG is going to go haywire if you try to do that. This is not a weapon tier list, to be clear. We are categorizing. Um, I'm not saying that Slayers are better than Anchors. I'm saying that uh, these are just some distinctions we can make, some patterns we can identify in the weapons. Don't consider Neo Splash a Slayer. Neo Splash absolutely can slay, but it can also support. Um, it's in one of, one of those... This tier right here is actually really good for the most part because these are weapons that like can play support, but whenever they want to, they can also just go ape mode and, and splat people um, with some exceptions. Like the junior can't go ape mode until it has special, um, but like these three in particular, like they can like K-Shot, it gets its special, it launches its special, and then it goes and kills people using the combination of the special and its main weapon. Um, the Zap does exactly the same thing. It farms until it has armor, but then it plays and holds forward like a T-Tech when it has that armor. Um, like, the Splash is more in the, the category of the K-52 where there are two roles that it can just play extremely well. Um, with the K-52, it slays and it skirmishes. It can just do both, and it is ec excellent at, at specializing at both. The Neo Splash can slay. It has that perfect jump accuracy, it, uh, that super nice laser with the fire rate and everything, w with burst bombs to combo with its damage so it can hit stuff from further away. That's insane. Its lightweight movement speed is insane. Like, it's one of the best slaying weapons in the game. And it's also one of the better supports in the game. If you want a bomb rush and you want someone who's going to paint a lot, you grab a Neo Splash. It's one of the best painting weapons in the game. It synergizes really well with bomb rush because it also paints really well. You can actually just do both with this weapon. Um, so it's a little bit different than the others where like these kind of depend on having a special to be able to slay, or this one too. Whereas this one can just kind of do whatever the heck it wants to. Um, Flingza is another good example. A Flingza is going to spend most of its time painting for special because it can just do that really safely and it paints a lot. But like, if you want it to, it can just go and do like straight up splat roller things and do them just as well as any of those other rollers. Um, and that's why it's like one of the most popular rollers right now, on top of the fact that it has missiles and farms for them really quickly. What are you going to do with Baller though? I will say, Baller was a better special at one point in time. Uh, at one point in time, the, the meta was Baller spam. And so you saw a lot of the Baller ink brush and a lot of gold arrow spray because they got it really quickly. More reserved in midline. So, Squivig, uh, my categorizations differ quite a bit from FLC. FLC would call the Nautilus Crossfire Utility. That's the categorization he would give it. And I trust FLC's judgment that there is a good reason in his, you know, top level analysis to make a distinction between Crossfire Support, or sorry, Crossfire Utility and Slaying. But for me explaining the game to newer players, I feel that it is more useful to just refer to it as a slayer, to label a slayer as your job is to push the objective forward, to push your team's zone of control forward, to do that by splatting people, um, to do that by taking advantageous fights and winning them very consistently and quickly. Because um, you can see there is no midline role that I'm giving it here. Uh, frontline, midline, backline, do not get it twisted. Those are not rolls. Those are ranges. Those are how far away can my weapon hit, not what is my weapon trying to do to win this match. Um, and that is something that FLC will definitely back up to, uh, at least that one part. But uh, Nautilus, you're right, it is a midline weapon. It is a fairly long range. But what it's doing is it's 
waiting for an opportunity to jump behind a corner and erase someone from existence. Um, so it's definitely a Slayer weapon, especially with the combination of it and Inkjet. Could Clash also be a Skirmisher? Skirmisher I am defining as a weapon that tries to draw aggro, to draw attention to itself, and not lose the fight, but survive the fight and wait for backup. A Clash Blaster is one of the most high commitment weapons in the game. As soon as you start hitting someone with a Clash Blaster, you either keep hitting them until they die, or they out DPS you and you die. You don't have a lot of mobility because the weapon has a slow fire rate by shooter standards, so you can't like paint your feet, you can't like splat dash away with it. And it also has really short range, so it's not like it, it can back up and use its range to kind of kite you out. Once you're in range, you kind of just have to hit two directs and hope that you kill them with that. And that's your only game plan. So I call it a Slayer weapon. Uh, I can really get my Slayer on in TC with Luna Blaster Neo for sure. K52 is mid-tier. Clearly. <laughs> Any advice for Nautilus players? How can I be more aggressive? Nautilus needs to get set up by its teammates. Its teammates need to paint for it. Its teammates need to distract other players and get the Nautilus advantageous fights. The best way you're going to win fights as the Nautilus is by looking at where your teammates are going and joining the fights that they start. So you're going to want to look at like what is the most frontline-y weapon, the weapon that's just going to try and run forward and kill things. And you kind of babysit that weapon. You sit right over its back shoulder, wait for it to get in trouble, and then you hop in with full charge and save the day. That's kind of what you're trying to do there. Um, Aplo is our, our babysitter on watercolor. Whenever one of us gets in trouble, Aplo is just there with their laser, and they help us. Using the machine, easier against opponents in medium, short range, but not right next to me. Exactly. You want to kite them. You want to use the full extent of your range on the machine. Um, you want to make sure that, like, they can't hit you when you're going in for fights. Um, you're kiting them. Consider blobs a rat. Absolutely not. Uh, a rat weapon has high mobility and high kill threat at especially short range. Um, a blob is none of those things. The rat weapons are there to like try and live in your base. Blob is a squirrel throwing nuts at you from halfway across the map. <laughs> I guess if we're, we're labeling them all rodents, then uh, the K-52 is a beaver. Um, the the Hydra Splatling is like a, a, a capybara or something really big. Um, is a badger a rodent? The, the Hydra is kind of a badger. I like badger for that. Um, then uh, <laughs> rodent tier list. Now, get tier zoo on. Baller L3. So Baller L3 is in the location it's in specifically because that is the way that it plays in Turf War. Um, I've found out that there is a use case for L3 in competitive. Specifically, you run it in Turf War and you send four vanilla L3s off in different directions because it's a high painting weapon with high range and it has the survivability special of the Baller that it can trigger whenever it runs into too many other L3s on the enemy team. Um, there was a, a tournament match that I have been made aware of in which four vanilla L3s played against four sploosh sevens for Turf War um, at very, very high level. It's wild what the meta devolves into in that mode. Why would Brella be considered a skirmisher if they're uh, supposed to excel in 2v1s? Um... I didn't say that Abrel was supposed to excel in 2v1s, that it was supposed to engage in them and not die. Uh, the way to beat Abrella, yes, is to 2v1 them by flanking around the side of the Brella. Um, but what a skirmisher is really going to do is just draw aggro, distract the enemy team, bring people onto it to put them in an advantageous position for the rest of your team. Um, Abrella isn't going to be very fast and consistent at getting picks, but what it is going to do is cause other people to have to deal with it. If you need two players to deal with that one weapon, that's creating a numbers advantage for your team on the rest of the map. So as long as you can use that shield and stay alive, 
hopefully the rest of your team in the next three or four seconds is going to be able to do something with that that makes it worthwhile that you ended up in a 2v1. Distraction tactics exist in this game. Do moving around until your teammate saves you with a valid strategy? Absolutely. In fact, every weapon in the game is going to have to do that at some point in time. One of the things that I've stressed a number of times and will stress again and will probably stress again before the end of the stream is that every single weapon in the game can play any of these roles. The reason that I'm categorizing them is that these are the weapons that want to do these roles the most. So like a T-Tech wants to slay, but if you put two T-Techs into a fight, one of those has now got a skirmish. That's just the way that the game works. You need someone to draw aggro and stay alive to give the other player the opportunity to play the Slayer role. And the way that you determine which role that is is very simple. Who is the enemy team shooting at? It's shooting at the whoever it's shooting at, that player needs to disengage and play safe and keep itself alive, skirmish, in order for the other teammate to take advantage of the fact that they're not getting shot at and slay. So um, those kinds of distraction tactics, that's what the skirmishers excel at, but every weapon can skirmish and should skirmish in any situation where you end up in a 2v1 and you're the one who's getting focused. Now, there is a limit. And that limit is do not do what most Neo Sploosh players do which is literally just paint in the enemy base and farm for missiles and only ever spam missiles. That is not a useful thing for you, you to do in, on your team because you're not actually drawing enemy aggro if they know how to counter this. The way to counter this is to ignore it and to deal with the missiles as best you can, but to know that this is always going to be putting its team in a 3v4. So don't, don't be that Neo Sploosh. Nobody likes that Neo Sploosh. Rodent tier list for April Fools. Let's watch competitive Turf War. It is fascinating. Turf War is a very interesting game mode. Um, it's very broken and weird, and I don't like playing it, but as an intellectual exercise for understanding the game better, Turf War is really, really interesting. While pushing the tower, in what situations should an anchor not be on the tower? Um, that depends on the map, on the mode, and on the weapons. Um, there are definitely some positions where anchors can hold a really strong position and protect the tower better by not being on it. And then there are some positions where the support is going to be more useful if they are pushing forward and pushing the enemy team back. In general, if you need to push the enemy team further back, you probably want the support further forward. And if you can just kind of control a zone that the anchor is able to have good line of sight on, then you want the support on the tower. Um, but it really depends between those two. And on a competitive team, you're often going to see those two players have a conversation about who's taking tower before the match starts. Blob in my base sounds pretty annoying, though. Um, do not want to awkwardly die to a random blob who's just doing stuff that shouldn't work. Shouldn't work is the key word there. The thing about the blob is that it, it can kill really quickly, but it has to hit all of its blobs. And that's really inconsistent, especially if you're in open terrain. Uh, the enemy team can kind of just like dodge through your shot and only take half the damage of it. Um, so your your kill time is very inconsistent and you really are in a higher percentage play by using your range and backing up and kiting people. Why is V-Try a Slayer if it has armor? Armor does not define the support. Uh, the support is defined by being a weapon that focuses on getting paint control and then giving help to its teammates. Um, yes, the armor does give help to its teammates, but the, the try itself has a burst bomb and another attack that count combos with the burst bomb to kill. Um, and it has a very fast, very, very consistent kill time and can hit up over walls. At short range, you, you can at best trade with a try. Um, it's just a very, very consistent weapon at getting kills. Um, and it can also do damage to two players at the same time. So like it's DPS numbers, it's not like do full damage to this player and then do full damage to this player like you have with a shooter. It's I am hitting both of these players at the same time. A tri slosh can trade in a 1v3 um, as long as one of those players isn't looking the right direction. So um, 
try is definitely about getting kills and using it for armor support primarily is generally suboptimal for that weapon um yes the armor helps and it can help you know support its own pushes as it goes in but if you're looking for an armor support something that's just going to get a lot of armors and have them at exactly the right moment you need them for every single fight in the game we're talking about like an end zapper or a junior um or maybe a 96 if you need some range all right so i would love to stick around and answer more questions and everything uh, but i do have a commitment at the top of the hour so i will need to head out what's the best missile support uh i would argue k shot zap 89 is very close behind it they're very similar weapons and sometimes the auto bomb is actually preferable uh, i would not consider the v jet to be a support weapon but if you define things slightly differently that's also very much in the running okay i have to head out folks um thank you for watching uh this will of course be on the vod on youtube so you'll be able to see it there if you missed part of the explanation i am probably repeating myself a lot too so i don't know you may just hear the same thing over and over again here and there but um, you can at least see how i'm categorizing all the weapons there and why they're in the places that they are you'll also be able to hear all the differences that i have with flc's system of defining these things um so hopefully you know flc doesn't get too mad at me for the way that i've changed his system here it's mostly for the purposes of simplifying it so that it is easiest to explain what someone's overall play style should be on a given weapon um and if I've accomplished that to any more significant degree than I had before, then I think I've done my job with this stream. So thanks for watching, everybody.